you seen the new Dune? The what is it? Dune two. Dune two, Hyper Dune. I've not seen it. <laughs> I want to see it. Hyper Dune, Ultra Dune. Ultra Dune, Dune, Dune two, Electric Dune. It's Boogaloo. back and better than ever. It's uh, it's Ex- the best. with extra worm. <laughs> but I I'm do having, love extra worm. I do I'm love having extra more uh, Twinings tea. Because I am that bougie. What I've learned from you is this is what bougie people drink. It's the posh tea. It's the posh tea. So posh. That's me. That's me. Posh. Um, Anyways, you know, I haven't seen it. So you haven't seen it either, right? No, not yet. Have you uh, heard about what Neil deGrasse Tyson, friend of the show? No, I've not. Please, please enlighten me as to what he has said. I've heard that he's... um, talking about in in true form he's he's making announcements about how the science doesn't check out in oh, the yeah. in the worm in the new worm movie which in, i find to be very interesting and compelling and now i refuse to watch it yeah Thank you, Neil. <laughs> uh the you know i think the thing is is that when you're watching a science fiction movie if you forget the fiction bit then you're just not going to enjoy it are you like you know it's kind of like uh, uh, when Star Trek: The Next Generation did the 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 Israel Palestine episode, and they got that wrong, didn't they? Um, they did an Israel Palestine episode. Well, it's not it's not it's not obviously explicitly Israel Palestine, but it's the one where Beverly Crusher gets taken hostage, and there's tunnels, and there's like oh, with the terrorists. Yeah, 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 and they're all terrorists, but they're actually they just want self determination, and the the Federation are like. We're just gonna help the 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 occupation, and uh, and that's the end of it. That, and like Riker has this like, like awful awful line at the end of it where he's like, um, maybe the uh, peace starts with just this one boy putting down a gun, and it's like a child putting puts his gun down. It's yeah, like, see, this is why I don't like I I love TNG, but I I it's it's never gonna be like my favorite series because there's too much of that energy. Now I can't speak all of Star Trek and generally speaking has that energy like at the end of the day there's a lot of radical stuff in like deep space nine but at the end of the day i don't really i'm never gonna like look to it as some sort of guiding like like some sort of guiding symbology for well you know how i should approach my politics at the end of the day they do default to like the state and all this stuff but it there are like deep space nine is far more radical you can find a lot of communist like Somebody's explicitly con- have, you, have you watched East Space Nine yet? Not yet. Okay, because there's an episode where they explicitly read from the Communist Manifesto, like sp- explicitly, explicitly when when one of the, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but there's a and, and like the Cardassians and the Bajorans were modeled after Palestine and Israel, and like there's there's a lot of like at least is what I've heard that that was what the writers intended as one of the comparisons. They also mentioned a few other uh, groups that they can point to historically but yeah so there's a lot it if it feels a lot more radical but you know at the end of the day it's a show what are you gonna do it's a show that that's on on like primetime television that's seen by a bunch of americans like how radical could it possibly ever be but what you're mentioning is really really cringe yeah yeah it's super cringe i was was like literally watching it the other night but yeah to to sort of like you know tie it back um we're 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 talking about i mean i've seen i've i've seen david lynch's dune which is the the superior version um uh, i love denis Villeneuve; he's great uh but nothing will top uh i can't remember the actor's name but it's kenneth something or someone kenneth and he's like baron harkonnen flying around floating and he's like laughing like a cartoon villain nothing's gonna top that for me it's just the best version but i know that it's supposed to be like well actually um this massive empire is trying to extract all these super resources from this desert planet where there's like an indigenous populace um and then like the the white guy becomes the messiah and then (laughs) but he's not really the messiah and it's all fucked up so it's another example of just like you know white people timothy chalet timothy 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 champagne timmy timmy chams um i don't know what he's so he's so good looking yeah i normally would never go for that kind of guy that more like twinkie (laughs) kind of guy but he is super like he is 
if you are like that twinkie and yet you can still be really appealing to me who normally is not into that type of guy, I think you have like some sort of incredibly aggressive X factor for attractiveness <laughs> because like this guy is appealing to so many people. He Wonka is boy. good looking. Yeah. Ugh. Wonka boy. He's got that. He's got that generic, uh, 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 aesthetically pleasing face. Right. Um, anyway, look, it's red planet and it's, uh, <laughs> It's Mule and Kira Day. How's it going? It's going to be a Mule and Kira Day, everyone. So <laughs> strap in, buckle strap up. Strap in and strap on. Strap, um, yeah, put your dildos on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what um, Mule, I was just trying to elaborate in case anyone. In case anyone didn't know what strap on meant. Yeah, that's that was a, to put that, your dildo on you. It's a really, really good, good, good thing that you did that. Yeah, no problem uh it's red planet welcome in i uh, hope everyone's having a great time and uh we're gonna start off with the thing that we start off the most all the time we do it every time uh what's the most base thing you did this week kara you go first actually oh you want me to go first this time okay all right that's fine uh, the most base thing I did this week, uh, it was the all members meeting, which we have every three months of uh, Great Manchester Tenants Union. And so I, I basically got roped into chairing the meeting with two of my other comrades and we all like just really weren't prepared for it. Um, and um, it went kind of good, but there is something to be said about sort of like being in charge of democracy. So I had to like prement, I, uh, sorry, I had to present like a motion that the committee had uh, taken from some meetings that we had about how GMTU is going to use our power to try and influence uh, housing policy with the upcoming election and stuff. Um, so we had this like whole big list of stuff uh, and the place that we were in didn't have a projector. And normally when we're doing these motions, we would have a big uh, projector so everyone, all the members can can read the motion and, and be like, okay, I'm not sure about that line, not sure about that line. But we didn't have that. So I just had to read it and hope that everybody was paying attention. So I was reading it very slowly um, and, and making sure that, you know, looking up after I've read each point to make sure everyone's like not looking confused. And then, then everyone was kind of like saying stuff like, oh, I'm not sure if there's this bit in it. Um, but if there isn't, then we should amend this. And then I'm desperately looking through this fucking document. It's not even that big. It's like, it's like that big. And, um, you know, like an A4 page or something. And I'm just freaking out going like, is that in there? I don't know. I've not even read it. And so I'm just writing it at the bottom. I'm like, okay, amendment one. There we go. Is that passed? Yeah. Okay. Right. Fine. That's passed. Uh, just, it was so stressful. I was freaking the fuck out. Um, but we got it done in the end. Now you know how Biden feels. I <laughs> yes because biden's always doing that isn't he he's always like saying to everybody uh in the democratic party members supporters everything he's always saying yes how should we change this bill do you want to change it to something else should we vote on every amendment yeah he makes sure no one's confused um make sure that everybody fully understands what's going on um uh, and then and then passes a very democratic thing and uh, everything is good and fine. So that was that was a bit that was a bit intense. Uh, but on top of that, it was good. Um, yeah, there was there was like a bit of an interesting uh, thing that happened, which was unfortunate. Where like, uh, so I'm just going to tell you about this because it's pretty funny. It's unfortunate because there was a person who took it really badly and like left the meeting. Uh, but there's this person who is involved in like a campaign. I'm obviously not going to mention any names because I respect our members uh, campaigns that we've been on uh, to resist gentrifications and stuff and stuff like that. That's been going on developments all over greater Manchester. And she was, she was talking a little bit like she was getting a little bit cringe and she was talking about like cabals and she was talking about like, you know, globalists and stuff like that. And I was, and I was about to, I was about to be like, I'm going to have to stop her in a, in a second because it's about to get real weird. But then she started joking about electoral politics and saying things like Keith Starlin uh, and Tony Blyer. And I was like, okay, that's pretty funny. She could keep going as far as I'm concerned. But then she said, Keith Stalin though. No, no, it's pretty funny because it's true because he is like an authoritative. Uh, yeah. Sort of, but when people make know. Stalin jokes and then also do anti-Semitic, Oh like, yeah, sure. Potentially sure, anti-Semitic. Sure, sure. 
stuff like i do not align with that no no no, no. so this is this is kind of what, what i'm getting to with this um <laughs> She then said, uh, well, he's got a knighthood, hasn't he? And pretty much anyone who's got a knighthood is probably a paedophile. And that was really funny. So pretty much everybody left, but this one person got really upset and left. And I felt really fucking sorry for him because it was like, oh, but just that, like- the... if the, That's the line though? That's, that's a little- <laughs> That's what I mean. That's what I mean. I was like, okay, come on. Like at that point, I literally said, okay, like, let, let's move on. Um, but this is the thing, you know, when, when you're, when you're organizing with people, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna come across some people who just have the most absurd opinions. This woman's just basically a, a, a COVID denier. Like that's, that's the extent of like, her no, politics. that's, that's, I was yeah. going to say, like, if she's talking about pedophiles, but she also mm. has these types of, uh, potentially what I would consider to be, you know, it's not explicitly no, no, no. anti-Semitic, but it's, yeah, yeah very likely it's pretty, it's pretty, yeah i'm gonna put them in like the QAnon pile yeah yeah yeah. no no for sure they they you know? fully 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 are and it's funny because it's like you know th that later on we're talking about doing anti-fascist uh work to make sure that like the reactionary far right are not entering into our spaces and like hijacking housing like we were, <laughs> we were talking about like uh, uh i think this last week maybe no i might be confusing this with like the, the GMTU committee meeting, but we were some someone someone was talking about the housing. Oh my god, it's called like the house the UK housing first party or something. And they're trying to hijack the housing issue to be like, oh, asylum seekers are just like coming over and they're getting given houses and we deserve council houses, the white people and blah, 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 blah. And that's, so we you were, know what? That's yeah. that's uh, that's a copycat of the America First movement, yeah. which originated I believe the 1930s by the mm. uh, Nazi group that yep. uh, that created that slogan "America First," and then Trump picked it up, and now it's it's now been exported, mm -hmm. which is what we call yeah. imperialism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when we were talking about that, this woman said, "Who would be the far right?" And I just went, "Oh man, oh, we're gonna we're gonna have to have a conversation, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like." Oh, Jesus Christ. So yeah, very, very like, you know, uh, cringe stuff happening, but it's one member and, you know, we, we have to, we have to like sit there and like, honestly think like, how do we breach this? How do we, how do we approach this? How do we find out exactly what her, you know, sort of like ideology is kind of thing and how do we best address it? And it would be cool if we could just like have a GMT re-education camp, but like, that's definitely... Uh, not possible so you know like yeah so it's a very it's a very it, it's a very difficult thing to do especially when things like that arise um to to chair a meeting like that do you know what i mean because it's like a i didn't fucking want to be in charge i didn't i didn't run for election to be chair like and even the chair when they're when they're elected they're not actually in charge of the union it's the, it's the members you're no keir stalin i'm literally not keir stalin Mm -mm. You don't want the leadership. You don't want the authority. So that was that was that was very very difficult. But apart from that, everything went very well, and everybody enjoyed it, and everybody was uh, very interested. There were some new people there for for an all member meeting. Uh, there was like thirty three people there, and that might not sound like a lot, but it was definitely like big for what we get. We've had we've had annual general meetings where there have been about thirty people there. Um, so for like a, a three monthly, like quarterly all member meeting for a housing union, it was actually really, really good. And then afterwards, afterwards, we went to a pub and there were some members who were in a folk band and they were singing like folk songs and stuff like that. And, you know, solidarity forever and all that stuff. So that was pretty based. Um, but yeah, aside from other tenants union stuff, I did, that was probably the most based thing that I did this week it was very difficult. Um, so please feel sorry for me. <laughs> but Kara, what about you? Oh, uh, well, I was at that meeting. So mm. that's I was doing base stuff just just as your shadow. It's you true. didn't see me there though. But like, yeah. So basically everything you said is what I what I did. That's true. But um in in <laughs> I, I I in all seriousness, I've been still kind of like down for the count in a lot of ways, but I've been trying to uh, do a lot of kind of administrative life work, um, figure out my housing situation and, and a bunch of things. 
and um, also played a little bit of Hell Divers, which is you know spreading democracy. So I'm spreading democracy. I've heard that that I've heard that the you you're the good guys in that in that game the good guys are the... you're definitely of the america basically so and they're the you good know. guys they're the good guys yeah they're good guys yeah yeah okay yeah you're 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 fighting uh, a, a bunch of aliens by going to where they live and killing them and then weirdly enough you're also looking for ore to extract so i'm sure there's nothing to that it's just probably helping to fuel more democracy that's important. It is important because in order to have democracy, America needs to have all the resources. Right. That's how it works. Right. And we can't have anyone take our freedom away. No. They're jealous of it, you know. They're jealous of our freedom. Freedom isn't free, is it? It's not. It ain't free. No. No. So I'm glad you're doing your part. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. So I'm clearly clearly doing a lot of base stuff. But we want to know what base things you've been doing, viewer slash listener. You can message us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, or send an email to based at redplanetshow.com. Include your name and pronouns if you're cool with that, and we may shout it out in a later episode. In that in that way, I won't feel like so much like I'm on little island here, because then I can read someone else's base thing and I can kind of, you know, it. To, to the passerby, it might sound like it's my base thing, you know, if they're not paying attention. So I can hijack someone else's base thing. Yeah. So feel free to submit your base thing to us. Do it for Kara. If you don't do it for, if you don't do it for Kara, what kind of a comrade are you? Kara is easily the most important comrade on this show. Um, so think about that. Think about Thank that. Thank you for acknowledging that. I appreciate it. It's the elephant in the room. I'm glad someone said it. <laughs> Uh, but listen, speaking of Kara, you got some news to tell us, haven't I, you? I do, I do. Um, let's start out with discussing the Houthis. So there was a Houthi attack against commercial shippers uh, serving Israel and killed three people. Three, th three sailors were killed in a Houthi attack on March 6th, the first fatalities in a months-long campaign against commercial ships supplying Israel by way of the Red Sea. The freighter, called True Confidence, was struck by a missile roughly 50 nautical miles off the coast of Yemen, setting the ship and its cargo ablaze. The ship was abandoned by the crew following the attack, which injured at least four, in addition to the three fatalities. A later attack targeting another commercial ship and some U.S. destroyers was repelled on the morning of March 9th by the U.S., U.K., and French forces, who have claimed the destruction of 28 Houthi drones. Houthi attacks continue to attempt to block passage of goods into Israel, claiming solidarity with Palestinians in the ongoing war on Gaza. Brigadier General Yahya Sari, a spokesman for the Houthi military, has stated that they will not stop until the aggression is stopped and the siege on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is lifted. In response to the attacks, the U.S. and its coalition has performed multiple bombing raids in Yemen. In addition, the U.S. has designated the Houthis as a terrorist organization in an attempt to cut off cut Yemen off from the international finance system, a move that likely will increase humanitarian and economic suffering within the country. Classic us, classic America. Um, but Newell, mm. can you tell me what's going on in England? You're you're British, right? Do I have that I don't right? Know. Uh, uh, daily i'm always questioning but uh, <laughs> apparently yeah apparently i'm british so since you're british you know all the things that happen on your island it's not a very big island could you tell <laughs> me what's going on there yeah sure um so this is this is actually really interesting news this is um a document that has recently uh been uncovered from the national archives that reveals mi5's involvement in the miners strikes and how it was significant in crushing british working class resistance so if you know about the miners strikes um you know the, these were like very very important organized working class struggles um to do with the the, the closure of, of coal mines in britain and, and just how much uh that would make the working class people who worked in the mines suffer obviously it's like a, a very sort of far removed struggle today because uh we're very climate conscious in in the contemporary era um but back in the day it was super super important you know there were lots of jobs that were going to be lost and uh, it was all down to uh basically 
horrific, horrific, vile hell demon uh, Margaret Thatcher. Um, so yeah, what what are the what are the what are the points of this story? Uh, a document recently uncovered from the National Archives shows the extent to which the British intelligence service MI5 was involved in assisting Margaret Thatcher's government to defeat miners organized by the National Union of Mine Workers during their year-long strike action beginning in 1984. One of the most significant acts of worker resistance in British history, the miners' strike was aimed at preventing the closure of mines by the National Coal Board. In the early half of the 1980s, the Conservative government, led by Margaret Thatcher, sought to reduce and ultimately privatise the heavily subsidised coal industry. An earlier attempt to close the mines in 1974 resulted in a strike, awarding the unions a new contract, which protected the nearly 200 mines still in operation. But by 1981, Thatcher was making moves to succeed where prior Conservative governments had failed, building a stockpile of coal, converting some power stations to burn oil, and recruiting scabs in anticipation of sympathetic railwaymen who might support uh, striking miners. In 1984, the National Coal Board announced the closure of 20 mines at the cost of 20,000 jobs, stating that the agreement reached in 1974 was obsolete. Uh, Documents released in 2014 indicate that this was, as suspected by unions, the beginning of a longer-term plan to close 75 pits over three years. The resulting strike was hampered by a failure by the union to secure a national ballot in support, leading the High Court to declare the dispute illegal when the union refused to end the strike. It was held in contempt and its funds were ordered to be seized by the court. In anticipation of this order, the union transferred their funds offshore in Dublin, Zurich and Luxembourg in an an effort to hide them. While this was successful at first, the funds were ultimately located by Price Waterhouse, the accountancy firm in charge of the investigation through the means of their discovery. Sorry, though the means of their discovery remained a secret. The newly uncovered memo addressed to Thatcher from the then Cabinet Secretary Robert Armstrong reveals that the senior partner at Price Waterhouse responsible for finding the funds had been introduced to an MI5 officer who agreed to provide information to help trace the miners' funds in exchange for information which could identify foreign backers of the miners' union. Through this exchange, which included information derived from wiretaps operated from MI5, Price Waterhouse was able to quickly locate and seize the union's funds, crippling their ability to maintain the strike. Uh, so as as was basically uh, always assumed to be the case, uh, there were some dirty dealings going on with the state in, uh, in, in basically bringing an end to the miners' strike. And uh, this new document just basically confirms it. So, you know... Uh, fuck MI5 uh, they must be dismantled and so must the, Brit- the British state I uh, can't, can't tell you how much I hate this country more and more every day I hate it more um, I do want to note that um, Margaret Thatcher and all the members of MI5 none of them are patrons of ours actually <laughs> so I think that says a lot that does say quite a lot Margaret Thatcher what are you doing like why aren't you supporting the working class revolution Look what her footprints are, and then it makes sense that she would never be one of our patrons. You know, it makes sense. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. But Kira, uh, we are always uh, very proud to have you uh, uh, doing your amazing reporting on uh, the ongoing situation in Palestine. Please go ahead and tell us what's up. Sure. Um, So as I do every week, uh, I talk about Palestine a little bit more in depth than most of our stories. But this is not even remotely a comprehensive um, report on what's going on in Palestine. It would be pretty much impossible to provide that. There are too many stories. There's too many tragedies. I will be providing you with some notable things. Um, but but just to tell you that this is not even remotely the gravity of the situation. Um, today marks, this is not specifically about Palestine, but this is just in, with respect to our uh, Muslim viewers and listeners. Um, today marks the eve of Ramadan. So happy early Ramadan or Ramadan Kareem. Ramadan Kareem. Um, unfortunately, the death toll in Palestine is now exceeds 31,000. I should note that this is the official death toll. This is not the unofficial, which tends to be a little more accurate because um, of the the meticulousness of how these death tolls are arrived at and how they tend to have a name attached to every single death. Lots of bodies are unidentified. 
lots of bodies are under the rubble. Um, lots of, lots of, there's a, there's a lot um, of death that is not being accounted for in these estimates that you'll read. So just take them as like a very, very low ball, which is horrific. Also note that this is the vast majority of these people are non-combatants. Um, the most of them are women and children. Okay, so I actually want to spend a little bit of time today not talking specifically about the, the horrors that are happening in Palestine, though I will get to that later, but I kind of want to focus a little bit on Joe Biden, Genocide Joe. Friend of friend the, of the show. show. Friend of the show. <laughs> um, so we talked about this a little bit uh, last week, but uncommitted voters are making a statement in the U.S. Prim presidential primaries. So as your resident American, I'm going to explain this to you. The way that primaries work in the U.S. Um, is that every U.S. state has a date where its voters are tasked with deciding who the next president is going to or who the next presidential candidate is going to be. So if if you're a registered Democrat, you will vote for um, or it, it gets kind of weird. Every single state has their own little things. But generally speaking, if you're a registered Democrat, you will be deciding who the Democratic uh candidates going to be. And there's a lot of annoying math that goes into it. There's a lot of different ways that each state ranks this and that electoral college, this and that it's, it's a mess, but that's the way that you end up having Joe Biden as the, as the guy that's, you know, representing the democratic party versus Bernie Sanders or so on and so forth. Right. So every single state has their own date. Some of these dates are on their own, but some of these dates are overlapped. Many of them are overlapped. It's understood that Many of the voters in America are pretty impressionable, little, little, little impressionable sheep. And so the outcome of the earlier primary elections has a lot to do, has a heavy bearing on the outcome of later ones, especially since many candidates will end up dropping out if they don't get enough votes in the earlier primaries. So enter Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is a date earlier in the primaries where approximately one third of all the delegates to the prime presidential nominating conventions can be won, which is more than any other day. The results on Super Tuesday are therefore a very strong indicator of the likely event eventual presidential nominee of each political party. You may be familiar with the Super Tuesday, Super Tuesday um, from 2020, where Bernie was pushed out of the race by an unprecedented last second coup effectively by the Democratic Party, where Biden's incoming administration, assisted by Obama, galvanized support for Biden by urging other candidates to drop out before Super Tuesday. And uh, if you recall, notably, Bernie's rival, Elizabeth Warren, remained in the race, effectively splitting the progressive vote, hurting Bernie further. The unusual move allowed Biden to collect all the liberal scraps remaining from the dropouts and gave Biden the quote unquote win over Bernie, which led to Bernie stepping out of the race. So just to give you a sense of like the significance of Super Tuesday and also to jog your memory is what happened last time. Now, this year, Super Tuesday fell um, this past week on March 5th, and it was far less dramatic, right? We There's no grassroots pseudo-socialist movements to back. There's no ceasefire candidate. There's really only Joe Biden and anger, the anger of all of us for him continuing to support this ongoing genocide of our Palestinian comrades. Um, so there's really no progressive anything on the ballot. There's no ceasefire candidate. There's just the Joe Biden and our anger. So as a result, pro-Palestine activists have been urging voters to cast a protest vote for the option, quote unquote, uncommitted. And this is provided on the ballot. Every single ballot has the option of uncommitted. So prior to this year's Super Tuesday, Michigan, who had their um, primary in February, I think it was February 27th, and was therefore very meaningful for subsequent states. Remember, like I said, the earlier states because of the little sheeple, little impressionable sheeple nature of the American voter. Um, <laughs> earlier states have a, a big, you know, make a big impression on the results of later states. So Michigan is one of the bigger deals states because of it's, it's an earlier state. 
They saw more than 100,000 uncommitted votes, which is a whopping 13%. This is this is unprecedented. This Super Tuesday, which was this past week, saw thousands more voters take uh, the lead of Michigan, notably in Minnesota, where nearly 20% of voters chose uncommitted in protests of Genocide Joe, which is huge. As a result, a network of major Democratic donors are now raising the alarm about Joe Biden's performance, saying that the uncommitted movement premiering in Michigan and and demonstrated later on in Super Tuesday, is a wake-up call for the president. A leaked memo to donors of the mega-donor Democratic network, Way to Win, which is not only generates millions for Democratic candidates and specifically Joe Biden's uh, uh, upcoming or his election, but also is responsible for directing way more money. Like they are, they, they're, I looked into them. They're an org that like receives donations and, and helps to direct them places. So they're very influential. A memo that they sent to their donors warned their members of the massive uncommitted movement saying that members should quote, not try to argue ourselves out of the fact that Michigan is a major warning signal that something needs to change that too many voters in close swing states who are fed up with the system will choose either to not vote at all, vote but skip the presidential ballot, or vote for third-party can presidential candidates. We are seeing this everywhere in the data. They also stated, Michigan's 100,000-plus uncommitted voters in 2024 are a siren and a clarion call. The energy behind uncommitted is not something that should be ignored, taken lightly, or dismissed as isolated to Michigan. Michigan 2024 is not an anomaly, just as Michigan 2016 was not. And we saw the result of that later on in the in Super Tuesday, and they were correct. The memo also cited that, quote, nearly three quarters of Gen Z voters now say they disapprove of Joe Biden, of President Biden's handling of Gaza, with 58% of 18 to 34-year-olds favoring unconditional ceasefire. To remedy this, the memo suggests strategic imp the strategic imperative of changing the course on Gaza, saying that Biden needs to hear the concerns of the voters he's lost, including activists, this is what they said, activists, Muslims, Arab Americans, voters of color, young Jewish voters, and young voters in general. So it looks like the uh, staunch stubbornness that that many of us are demonstrating with our vote for uncommitted or our refusal to vote at all actually is getting the money concerned. The Democratic funds, the the funds that are going into Joe Biden's upcoming his uh, his election, um, is concerned about the stubbornness of people like you and me. So in an attempt to assuage voters, Biden included uh, included a, a little tidbit, it's the best I can put it, uh, during his State of the Union this past week. Um, he said that he intends to set up a temporary humanitarian aid port in Gaza in the Mediterranean Sea, insisting that no U.S. boots will be on the ground. So that's his, uh, his that's, that's him trying to win back your favor. In my opinion, of course, he claimed that this war has claimed more innocent lives in Gaza than any other war in Gaza, which obviously, but he also stated that more, he also stated that more than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, quote, most of whom are not Hamas. So he's doing the thing that I always notice liberals do, where they create a horrible situation, and then they stand next to it and point at it and tell you how horrible that situation is and tell you that you the way that you need to address the situation is give me more power. While the entire time never acknowledging that their hands are directly involved in the creation and the continuation of that situation. So he's he's just doing the regular liberal thing. However, Pro-Palestine pro -Palestine protesters were not having this from Biden. They were not having it. As the U.S. remains Israel's biggest military supplier, effectively making this ongoing genocide possible, protesters blocked Biden's route to his state of the union, yelling, not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crimes, and projecting Biden's legacy of genocide on a nearby government building. 
This is really cool because this echoes what happened in the UK when they were having that supposed vote with the SNP for a ceasefire um, that got completely fucking destroyed and and they also beamed like onto the parliament buildings uh ceasefire now uh or something to that effect so it's it's really cool to be able to see the 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 actual mirroring of stuff that's going on in different imperial core countries regarding this and it's just like so 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 important i think uh what the the point i was trying to make uh earlier was that actually the you know the uncommitted vote is actually having a, a direct effect on uh the money as you were saying and that was its entire that, that was its entire sort of function um because if you can get donors if you can get finances of campaigns to worry about the candidate then there is a potential for not only a, a switching of a candidate who is to someone who's more uh willing to say something like we want a permanent ceasefire or something you know a bit more progressive than what Joe Biden's doing, but it also might mean that Joe Biden might change his, his, his tune on it. So, well, it's way, um, yeah, it's way too late to switch up a candidate. Joe Biden will be the Democratic uh, nominee. He will be. Um, but he is clearly, he is clearly a guy that is firmly a capitalist. He is firmly uh, basically a shield to his donors. Like when he was elected, what was it? No, no, no. It wasn't when he was elected. At some point during his election in 2020, he told, uh, he told like, I think he went, yeah, it was that he told his donors that nothing will fundamentally change. So he said that when he was going to be elected, that don't worry, I'm not going to change anything for you. And this is, this is in order to, you know, assuage their fears because Bernie was just saying a bunch of stuff about, you know, 1% shouldn't needs to be taxed and and redistribution of wealth and blah 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 blah. So in my opinion, I don't see Joe Biden as a guy who is um very staunchly for his for anything. He's just he's just a guy that is the system. He's very much the system. And if the system, this is my this is just me being hopeful, but I do feel that uh this pressure coming from his mega donors that will make or break his campaign um, will have a, a God forgive me, a trickle down effect on to what he ends up <laughs> saying and doing. I do think that, that this will affect him. Now, will this affect him enough to actually do is like cause, you know, pull out all funds, like stop all USA to Israel insist that Netanyahu has to, um, has to uh, seize fire in in Gaza and then stop the entire genocide. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it's that strong, but I do think it's going to lead to some of these liberal concessions like humanitarian ports and you know some sort of you know more aggressive finger wagging. Um so I I mean I guess we'll see. So um also more about our friend Joe Biden. Joe Biden makes some contradictory remarks on Israel in order to further save face. So in a contradictory and plainly confusing interview with MSNBC yesterday, Joe Biden has warned that there are red lines that Israel should not cross in its war on Gaza, while also insisting that he would never abandon Israel, saying, quote, the defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line where I'm going to be going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. But there's red lines that if he crosses them, and then Biden said without finishing his chain of thought, adding that his administration cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. And if you listen to him talk, I haven't listened to Biden talk in a while. He's like slurs his words like the entire time and doesn't finish his sentences and, you know, do what you want with that. But I, he's not making any sense. I think he's just kind of panicking under the pressure a little bit and just trying to sound like he's like a really good guy that cares, but ultimately has no intentions of ever changing his tune. But did you not see him walk past that helicopter? Oh, what? <laughs> what? Is he supposed to be like cool guy now? This was, this was a couple of... This was a couple of weeks now. Um, I, I can't remember what the exact thing is because whenever this stuff just pops up, I just treat it like a clown show. Um, and and it was it was literally like he walked away from a press 
uh, a press pulpit and 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 liberals were tweeting the video and going look at his gait look how confident he is and he's just walking away normally um yeah really uh yeah this gives me flashbacks to the 2020 elections where like every liberal news outlet had body language experts that would analyze bernie sanders body and tell and talk about how his position how he's like a sexist basically and can't be trusted the <laughs> like, frame the frame the frame is wrong the frame's not right uh joe joe biden's frame though that's uh that's erect it's stiff uh you know I mean, it's... talk about like manufacturing consents like it, there's nothing more like profound than that just getting a per getting a quack on to be like this guy who is for the redistribution of wealth he can't be trusted. Look at it. Trust me. His look. I'm an expert in this. But this guy who's for maintaining business as usual, you know, siphoning wealth from the from everyone else, at the you know, and giving it to the most wealthiest people on the planet. No, he's he's good actually. He's he's sitting upright like he's got a rod up his ass. So you know that he's 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 definitely the right guy for the job. Yeah, very important. Very important uh, analysis. So a few more things, um, just to close out this segment. Uh, I just want to touch on two disgusting war crimes that Israel's committed. Um, these are a little bit in the past. You know, everything is recent, but like this is a few months ago uh, in November. November body cam footage from an Israeli soldier shows soldiers congratulating him for killing a defenseless elderly deaf man, where the soldiers laugh at how he was hiding by his bed and he had his hands up in surrender. And I saw this video and like it officially just ruined my fucking day. Like to I it's disgusting. It's it's something like these airstrikes are horrible. They're devastating, but there's something extra evil about walking into someone's bedroom and looking at them and laughing as you kill them, a defenseless elderly deaf man who has his hands up and he's shaking. And then watching everyone like high five him for doing so. Also photos from December reveal Israeli soldiers sniping an unarmed Palestinian boy in, in the Northern Gaza Strip. The incident took place during the forces incursion into the vicinity of Al Fakura school in the Jabalia refugee camp. So, yeah, just add those to the massive pile of war crimes that Israel is enthusiastically committing, backed by America's money and weapons and rhetoric. Lastly, the UNRWA calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, saying hunger is everywhere in Gaza. The situation in the north is tragic, where aid via land is denied despite repeated calls Ramadan is approaching. The death toll continues to rise. Humanitarian access across the Gaza Strip and immediate and an immediate ceasefire are imperative to save lives. So this was your very brief, not comprehensive, but what I thought were some notable things to discuss coverage of Palestine this week. Thank you. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that we do have a Patreon. If you'd like to support us and see these shows continue, please check out our Patreon. Uh, Red Planet is made possible by the direct support of our viewers like you and our listeners. So check us out at patreon.com slash red underscore planet. Thanks very much, Kira. And now bringing you to the main segment of our show. Uh, I don't have an intro written for this, so I'm just going to wing it. Uh, there is so much to be said for seizing the means of communication uh, inside and outside of the Imperial Corps. And uh, we are very excited to bring uh, to you today, uh, Benny Caro Carollo Carollo. I think I might be saying that wrong. Please correct me. Um, and she's going to talk to us about leftist reporting, reporting from the left. How's it going, Benny? Welcome in. It's going great. I was like frantically trying to set all this up on my end because I'm like, not in my usual streaming place, very far away on the other side of the planet right now. Um, well, but, you've uh, done yeah. 
amazingly so thanks so much for joining us uh so we're we're talking with you today we're gonna have a long drawn out interesting uh conversation about i can't say your conversation is gonna be interesting what do you what what do you mean it is no and it will be but like you can't just self brag no we can and we have to and that's part of leftist reporting right because we have to we have to big ourselves up we have to we have to self promo you know this is exactly what we're talking about i said that so i could give you an excuse to say that by the way i knew you did that and that's why we're such good hosts um but benny uh talk to us a little bit just to begin with uh introduce yourself tell us uh your sort of history with uh leftist reporting because you've got a whole a whole thing you've got a whole a whole backstory about all that so if you uh are okay to talk about that that'd be great yeah yeah of course um well let's see because like i've been streaming on twitch for like quite some time now i think it's probably like coming around like four-ish years something around that ballpark um And, you know, spent a lot of time covering the news. I ended up doing some work with TYT for a couple years. And that was, like, a really interesting experience. Um, And I don't know. It it was cool because I got to, like, cover, like, a ton of topics on, like, a a relatively big platform. Uh, But, like, towards the end of it, I pretty much, like, ended up exclusively covering, like, trans issues. um, Which is, like, important and, like, important to me, obviously. But the only reason I was doing it is because, like... I'm trans and nobody else covered the trans stuff. Um, And so, which is like a whole nother like thing to talk about when it comes to like reporting, uh, especially when it comes to like trans issues, like in the left today, because there are a lot of people who are like on the left that want to be anti-trans and like have objective reporting about social issues. And it turns into this like huge issue. But um, that was kind of like the, one of the biggest things that I did, I tried to do like a lot more like, deep diving into specific topics doing interviews with people who've like done stuff on the ground um and it's hard to do that when you're like trying to churn out a new video every single day (laughs) um and i think that really is like probably one of the biggest struggles in like journalism is like balancing the need to cover the day-to-day stories and the need to cover like the more longer term in-depth things and even some of the things that do happen day to day just take a little bit longer to like actually like you know like if something happens if somebody's doing some type of direct action and you want to sit down and talk with them it's gonna at a minimum take like a couple days to get that organized and put together and you have to balance that with like well what is going to be trending um especially in like this youtube era so in terms of like my history that was kind of the big thing was was spending that time working with tyt because i actually went to that from working in politics um and uh and then obviously like i quit tyt because of all the transphobic stuff that was happening in like june and ever since then i've still tried to be around on like twitch covering like news and politics and stuff but mostly centered it around like media analysis and stuff because I kind of got really burnt out covering a lot of the topics and like just watching like Republicans threaten to like make my existence illegal uh <laughs> across the country which uh yeah I don't well, know so I don't if you're okay talking about it because I don't I you say like obviously you left TYT because of all the transphobia stuff um which I know about and Mule knows about but I don't know if all of our viewers and listeners are necessarily familiar with it and if you want if you're okay talking about it I actually think it'd be a good idea to discuss because I do think it very poignantly um identifies some major issues with um you know reporting on the left and what what the left means in terms of like the reporting world and also um kind of like the struggle that you dealt with like you took a very principled stand uh, that i am i'm i'm very proud to call you my friend and because like that was an incredible very brave thing to do and when you're like oh i just left I, i actually think that um discussing it for like a second would be would be great if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, because ultimately, like, so the three big things that Anna and Jenk were doing that were transphobic uh, was first and foremost, like, Anna complaining about, like, inclusive language. Um, 
you know, like that's just silly. And the complaining about inclusive language, it's one of the things that a lot of centrists will do to try and hand something that they think means nothing to the right. But what they're really doing is saying, no, no, it's actually totally fine to just delegitimize an entire category of people. Um, the second thing was Jank going on weird rants about trans people in sports and him confidently being ignorant about um, like hormones and stuff. Uh, and that is really interesting because like it speaks to two things. One, just like the willingness that people are to just accept whatever their assumptions are about the world as fact, especially when it comes to things like trans people and not actually listening to trans people. Um, you know, and <laughs> it, it's just one of those things where it's like, well, this is common knowledge. And it's like, well, okay, but it's like wrong. It's not common knowledge. It's just an assumption that a lot of people have because like the way the media paints trans people was just not true. And then the third thing uh, was like spreading misinformation about trans healthcare and basically making it seem like doctors are just handing kids hormones for no reason. Um, like uh, Anna even made a claim at one point on the air that like, there are doctors that are afraid of not giving hormones to kids because they, they think they're, they're afraid they're going to get canceled. Uh, not, of course, considering the reality that uh, that if they were just giving out hormones willy nilly, they'd lose their medical license. Getting canceled on Twitter is not the same as losing your medical license. <laughs> right. Uh, these are just like these are just transphobic right wing transphobic lines that being parroted by a group that claims to be progressive it might hold some progressive views but uh ultimately in my opinion are not very progressive and which is remarkable that they were kind of like generating not generating but parroting all of this transphobia while you were staffed there right like they'd have to and i know if i recall you did reach out to uh at least jank uh, or maybe anna you reached out to them and we're like, hey, I can help you. Like, I understand this better. I don't think you actually know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they rejected that, uh, you reaching out. So um, it just, it's just astounding to me that these organizations that claim that they're progressive when they're given like extremely like, here's an opportunity to listen to literally the trans person that you have deemed to be like, you know, actually credible and worthy of of of, of being on your team rejecting the information that you provide and and then claiming that they're still not transphobic in the process is just like really disgusting behavior <laughs> and i'm glad that you were able to 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 walk away from that scene because it's just got to be so draining and like soul crushing for you to be a part of that it's really funny on two fronts one because like Jen kind of suggested uh, that this wasn't my field of expertise, that he knew about all of these things. But like, you know, there was something there that I was missing. The irony is like my master's degrees in biotechnology. So granted, I'm not an endocrinologist, but I am both a trans person that kind of had to teach my doctor how to do my hormone therapy and kind of have a master's degree in a semi-relevant field. You know, I, I know a thing or two about how the endocrine system works. And uh, he was like, no, no, no. With my law degree and years of experience as a YouTuber, I definitely know better than this trans person. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just probably one of the funniest things, I think, of, of that whole interaction that I had with the phone call uh, with him. That's so um, wild. That's so fucking wild. I, I think what that speaks to is this kind of, uh, well, it's 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 absolutely like cis het male privilege. It's this idea that like if you're if you're a cis man, you're uh, you're the smartest boy. Like oh, I went to law. I've got a law degree. I've been doing YouTube for years, so I must know everything. Like so, you've got that element of it, and then alongside that, so you've got that 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 huge, massive blind spot of of ignorance and and reactionary ideas um that are also like you know <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna go out there and say that i don't think like you know cheng has like come to these conclusions himself like this is this is the thing that people say about trans people on the right right you know this is like this is it's all the same nonsense um no he's immune to propaganda all yeah, right of course he is of course he is but that's the thing like he will he will think that right he will think oh i'm immune to propaganda because i got all this experience for uh so i think what what that does is that links in with uh what you were saying earlier because um if we backtrack a little bit we you were you were saying how like it's it's very difficult to try and weigh 
what is trending with um you know the stuff that you want to report on right um with red planet we're very privileged that we don't have to worry about that too much because uh we've got a lot of great supporters and we can just get on like pretty much whoever we want if people are doing based stuff we can just bring them on um but like you're right like when it comes to uh you know actually trying to do something for your job um you you have to you have to think right okay how how am i going to grow this and tyt is a company right they're a company and they want to make money and so what are they going to do oh well, we're going to cater to these right wing reactionary opinions and we're going to get a big a bigger audience and we're going to bring in more uh you know centrist like you know quote unquote moderate lefts uh, uh liberals kind of thing um so you know it it you can you can sort of like understand why that it, obviously it's fucked and it, it shouldn't have happened but you can understand like maybe where that like sort of profit incentive overtook any kind of maybe sympathy they might have had for you and your struggle and trans people as a whole um i don't know if you have any insight um into that particularly or like you know what the inner workings of tyt were for in order in order to try and like get more viewers um if that was a, a thing that you were ever privy to yeah, um, I can't really speak in detail about, like, the inner workings of TYT, um, but I can talk generally about, like, how, in general, people try to cater to the YouTube algorithm in different ways, and one of the challenges that I personally had in trying to make content, um, you know, in a, you know, on a platform that is, like, designed towards, like, you know, trying to get clicks and views and stuff like that, because, Ultimately, one of the things that I had to do um, is, for example, if I wanted to talk about climate change, I would always have to find something else to talk about first and then sort of trick people into watching a video on climate change. Or if I had to explain something serious um, that was a little more in depth, I would have to find some sort of like clickbait to get people to like watch it. And so quite literally, a, a lot of journalism today, sadly, is at least if you're doing it right. Um, is to trick people into learning, right? You have to like, you have to give big flashy, shiny objects. And then after that sort of sneak in like a little bit of education because the way algorithms work, it's gonna wanna feed the lowest common denominator. And this leads to one of the other problems that's very tangentially related and also mirrors everything that Jenk and Anna are doing regarding trans people, which is you don't wanna alienate your audience, right? And so people are afraid of saying things that are obviously true, but people don't want to believe. Like, so for example, when it comes to everything that's going on with Israel and Palestine right now, there are a lot of liberals who simply do not want to accept as reality how horrifically the IDF is treating Palestinian people. They don't want to admit that it's a genocide that's happening. And so they will just be like, no, 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 that can't possibly be. That can't possibly be. And so if you just lay it out and you're very straightforward about what's happening, there are a lot of people who just refuse to accept it. And then they start to spiral and be like, oh, well, no, this can't be real because I'm super smart and I don't think this could possibly happen. And so you must be a conspiracy theorist, even though you're showing me evidence of what's happening right in front of my own eyes. And so you know, you have to like play this game where people are always like pandering to the right. They're pandering to people who have these popular assumptions. And so like, it is actually not that different, at least in terms of like the core mentality of what drives Jenk and Anna to say transphobic things is like what is driving a lot of like news outlets to not really be straightforward about what is happening to Palestinians right now, because they are catering to default baseline assumptions that people have about the world. And they're unwilling to be truthful in their reporting because oddly enough, they want it to sound more true to people who are just kind of living in a fantasy land. Because sadly, that's where a lot of Americans are today. Um, yeah. And I and I think um, also to just just to just to make the point that Jank and and Anna and all and anyone who is part of the perpetuation of transphobia while donning a I'm a leftist or progressive kind of label, I think at a certain point, it's not just like them trying to play this game knowingly base. They, they refute. This is my theory that people like that refuse to ever think that they are actually being manipulated by anybody else. They refuse to believe that they're actually, um, you know, they, they like to think of themselves as immune to propaganda, a, they, a free thinker, um, so on and so forth, a thought leader. And so to maintain that illusion while also maintaining their, their profits, um, they would have to then merge the two by truly believing 
what the bullshit that they're saying. Yeah, I think that's I think that's totally spot on it's it's you get you get this like horrific kind of amalgamation of uh you know you you want you don't want to believe that these people believe any of it to like a to like a degree right you you just you want to believe that like okay yeah they're just they're saying stuff because they know it's popular they're saying stuff because rotata and it's like obviously like super harmful but like uh ultimately um if you're if you're just refusing simply refusing to actually like engage with the topic in a in an actual scientific and correct manner then uh you're a piece of shit and you're harming people so that you know these these are the i think what the, one of the big things i wanted to talk about today with you is is literally like how the the broad news media is kind of what every person who is doing any kind of reporting wants to mimic right so you know the, the tyt they have the whole like setup they got the news desk they got the fucking like uh the graphics behind them and all this kind of stuff um and they're trying to appeal to that like idea of okay we're a serious news channel actually right we're a serious reporting uh, uh outfit and 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 with that comes that sort of like well you know, <laughs> if if you if you're gonna have all that, but say that you're leftist, well, you know, if if you're still saying reactionary stuff, you're still part of the manufacturing consent machine. You're no different than Fox News. You're no different from CNN. So, if we talk about um, the the vast majority of news media essentially manufacturing consent for the ruling class, despite so, because even CNN will do like slightly progressive reporting, right? Even Fox news have done like slightly progressive reporting in the past on like, I seem to remember like one story about like a, a, a trans kid. Um, uh, I can't even remember what the exact story was, but it was so shocking that this was on like Fox news. Um, and it, it was about like a young trans boy. Um, and it might've been something to do with it being bullied or like, uh, it must have been something to do with that. And and it was like done in quite a, a, a sympathetic way. So it's like, okay, so pretty much all of these news outlets are doing this stuff. Um, so, you know, why are we on the left trying to mimic that? Um, and I think like it probably comes down to, you know, that profit incentive. Yeah, well, it's like um, what Benny, it was like what Benny was saying. It's this like trying to cater to this market that it has this expectation of like the world that they want to see the, the, the parameters that they ha not, not that they've created, but they have inherited because let's face it, like not all these liberals and these right-wingers aren't just like spontaneously coming up with the same parameters. They're being fed these things. They're inheriting these, these ideas from people that are, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the propaganda machine that's giving them these ideas. And so in order to cater to that market and not, and, and to not like change it up too much. Um, yeah, just to still keep that same type of aesthetic. It's not even just the content, it's the aesthetic itself too, which is why we try to keep it sloppy around here. <laughs> <laughs> I do like it sloppy. Sorry. Unironically, I think one of the big like hurdles that a lot of journalists have is that they are encouraged to maintain a self identity as a smart person and the reason why it's dangerous to have a self-identity as a smart person is because then becoming whenever you're wrong that isn't just that that isn't just oh i guess i made a goof up right here i guess i just missed a piece of information then all of a sudden it's an attack on your identity right and so when i told jank he was wrong about trans people he didn't take that as a learning opportunity he took that as an attack on his identity as somebody who works in the news and the same is true with a lot of these liberals who will like hold up these you know falsities they can't admit that they were missing information and so of course this has to be treated as an identity attack and they're a smart person so they couldn't possibly be wrong so then they have to invent this entire delusion of themselves and the world around them in order to justify believing something that is observably untrue and it's funny because if you look at like, you know, you said manufacturing consent, if you go all the way back in time to when Noam Chomsky was calling out the New York Times for being in favor of the Vietnam War, you had all these journalists who were like, no, we were very critical. We were very critical. And he's like, no, here, look at all the articles that you all wrote. You were not critical of the Vietnam War. At most, you were like critical of specific decisions by specific generals, but you were very supportive of it. Um, but that's one of those things that just sort of went down the memory hole as soon as the war was over. And so 
ultimately it is this like creation of an identity of, of this identity of being a smart person paired with not wanting to turn off the right because of course if you're not seeing both sides, then you can't possibly be serious or objective or smart. You can't possibly just say, no, these right wingers are living in fantasy land and everything they say is wrong and they're just making stuff up because they want to gain political power and oppress people. If you say things like, yeah, I think most Republicans are just motivated by outright racism, then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 you're making a value judgment here. And as smart, <laughs> objective people, we don't make value judgments, even though if you look at the data, Data, it's pretty clear that a lot of Republicans are very obviously motivated by racism. But if you just say that, then all of a sudden you're no longer objective and you're no longer smart because, of course, you know, everybody, once again, is encouraged to be this super smart, independent, free thinker. And being motivated by racism isn't an independent, free thinker. So we have to invent fantasies about alienated white working class people. And that's why they decided to vote for Donald Trump. It definitely didn't have anything to do with his racism. And that's why, you know, don't look at the polling numbers about how many Republicans would actually like a universal health care system or anything like that. It You know, it, it it's definitely not racism. And so... Basically, in this game, they play with themselves to look balanced and fair and to make themselves look smart and objective. They are actually propping up right wing fantasies um, in order to basically gain media appeal. And they're mm -hmm. afraid of ripping off Band-Aids for people. So I in the in in the interest of continuing the, the conversation about, um, yeah, like propping up reactionary <laughs> ideas um i wondered if you had any any uh insights as a journalist on the recent interview of chaya Rychik by taylor lorenz did you see any of that i did and i'm kind <laughs> of like i don't know i've seen like a whole entire discourse about it and i honestly don't know where i land I do think to a certain degree, she did do a good job of pointing out that Chaya Raichik has no idea what she's talking about. Um, and I think there there is, to a certain degree, value in that. Um, I think the question of platforming is one that is like definitely worth having. And I don't know, I'm kind of I'm kind of like genuinely torn on that, to be entirely honest, on that ba delicate balance there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think like for me watching it, it was very much a case of well you know she's using the word transgenderism unironically she's saying i believe in gender ideology and shit like that and it was just kind of like yeah like <laughs> and this is taylor lorenz i'm talking about not chaya Reitrick, you know that this is this is taylor lorenz and so it's kind of like a very difficult like that's what i mean like this platforming it, it, for, for me personally i just thought well she's doing it because you know she she wants to do the big Chaya Raichik expose interview kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I, I personally was like just absolutely flabbergasted at the whole interview. I was watching it on my stream and just like, this is just absurd. I have no idea why people think that she came out looking really good at this. Uh, but listen, I'm, I'm willing to like stand and be corrected. Um, but like, you know, if we're, if we're uh, going to talk about like sort of, you know, <sighs> In terms of platforming, platforming, I guess you can re you can relate that to the platforming of reactionary ideas, right? So if you're if you're basically platforming reactionary ideas in your liberal reporting, then you know you're not you're not really actually like getting anything good done. Um, but we spoke a little bit as well about uh, the challenges of creating leftist media. Like you were you were talking about like the the sort of like idea of quote unquote tricking people, right? And it, and it's super difficult. And you also mentioned a little bit about getting burnt out when you're trying to re report on certain things. And I've definitely experienced that myself on my stream, where it's been like, uh, you know, you you want to report on every single thing that is important while having those like super key words of like, what is the thing that everybody's mad about today, right? And can I relate that in some way to talking about how direct action can solve this and organizing? Um, and that's the real struggle. So, you know, talk to us a, a little bit more about that in terms of, um, you know, because these are challenges. These are the challenges of, of creating leftist media that is like independent and important. Um, and what kind of struggles did you go through in, in trying to make that change to that kind of format? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the most difficult thing to talk about always was climate change um, on two fronts. One, it is emotionally difficult to just sit and talk to people about like, yeah, we're kind of doomed if we don't do like a lot about this. Um, you know, another thing that's hard to talk about climate change is that unironically, the best country right now when it comes to like developing renewable energies and everything like that is China. And if you want to point to like, what's a big country that's actually doing a lot to like, deal with climate change well it's china it's obviously china there's not any other like major country that is reaching Tanky. its climate goals in the same way <laughs> Tanky. oh no right, exactly oh no exactly We're, it's it's the dangerous tanky show there's three dangerous tankies on a panel together uh... so so yeah that is like a genuinely difficult thing because a lot of people don't believe that we can actually do anything about climate change. And the best way to get people to believe that we can do something is to point to a country that is doing something. And it's like, well, look at China. They're somehow managing to do this. So we definitely could. It's not that it's impossible. Um, and it's just a little bit doomer. Um, and for whatever reason, it doesn't get clicks. Because I think everybody on some baseline level know in like the back of their mind, they're like, we are a little bit doomed. We're kind of screwed. Like, we're destroying the planet and it, things are really, really bad. People have that like looming fear, but they don't want to look at it, right? It's like, you know, it's like there's a demon like sitting in the corner staring at you and you just like avoid eye contact and like pretend it's not in the room the whole time. And like that is climate change. It is this like haunting figure in the background that people don't want to look at because that would make it real. Um, and so getting people to like see news about climate change is just really, really difficult um, and so that's one of those things where you always had to like, you know, I would have to like find some clip of some Republicans saying some obviously ridiculous thing and then going in and like teaching people about like, you know, climate change and how difficult it is or like the fact that like there's a lot of rich people in big think tanks around the world that are thinking about doing things like, you know, putting like sulfur dioxide high up in the atmosphere to fix climate change by cooling the earth but don't want to talk about how it would cause massive droughts in west africa and like you know insane flooding in you know the like central asia or, or south asia and stuff like that they don't want to talk about how you know that i guess would to some degree prevent the cool the warming of the planet for a little bit of time but it would also have devastating environmental consequences in like third world countries and so um you know, people don't want to talk about it because like, honestly, when you talk about these things, people will just kind of paint you as some sort of conspiracy theorist, because once again, it's an obviously one sided thing. And of course, the smart brained journalists create this mentality that, well, no, if you say something is just one sided, you must be a radical extremist conspiracy theorist. It couldn't possibly be that there are just happen to be a lot of rich people that are profiting off of this. Um, you know, it has to be some sort of like evil conspiracy. And so you're a conspiracy theorist. And so those things are some of the most difficult ones to cover. It also was difficult to cover, um, to cover a lot of trans issues, because first and foremost, as a trans woman, a lot of people are going to say deranged things about my appearance, which like, whatever, I don't know, you can call me ugly all day long. I, that's not going to change what I see in the mirror. Um, <laughs> and then on top of that, there's just like a lot of people who just kind of don't want to believe and they once again want to play the game of well I'm this smart centrist liberal and how dare you suggest trans people uh you know be able to play in sports or they have takes like Anna where they're like you know I think trans people are fine but they shouldn't take scholarships from real women oops I mean you you know and then they like stumble on themselves because they realize what they're saying but like ultimately those are the issues that become very, very difficult to talk about, both because they hit on a personal level and because they are so obviously one sided, right? They are so obviously one sided. And I also did my best to try and cover, once again, countries like China and like Cuba that are doing like really awesome things and pointing out like the realities of, I mean, <laughs> the whole war in Ukraine was like a whole nother fiasco to like start talking about because it was like one of those things where it's like, yeah, Russia shouldn't have invaded Ukraine, but also it's silly to pretend that the United States wasn't wanting this to happen the whole time, right? Like, so both of those things can be true and people that want everything to, in some ways, be very one-sided, at least when it comes to US foreign policy. I think that is such a good uh, point because, and that I, I think that the... The fundamental sort of uh, uh, pervasive thing that 
that just permeates everything about like this discussion and what, what do the consumers of this kind of media want right and if you're in if you're in the west like us if you're in the imperial core you want everything to be like a neat concise simple package right you don't want to have a difficult nuanced discussion right it's like the ukraine thing that's a difficult nuanced discussion and for some people it's just easier to be like uh yeah like everything is really bad and we should give loads of money to ukraine and and that's really good and that's the end of my thinking about it right um, and then conversely, there are other people who are like, no, Russia are really good. And they're like reviving communism somehow. And, the you know, just nonsense. So, you know, it's 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 that kind of like very, I think that we, because we're so comfortable in the West, um, our, our news and our ideas have to be convenient, little, easy to digest, uh, you know, bite-sized, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, sound bites, you know, by, <laughs> literally sound bites uh, that we could just like say to our, our friends. Uh, and that's that. And I think that's like the big challenge when you said, <laughs> when you said you get called a conspiracy theorist, this is, this is literally something that I was called by my ex's dad. Like when I was explaining the, the Imperial core and the world world, when, when we're talking about um, uh, uh, the, the migrant crisis and, and uh, you know, countries that are, that are basically abused to extract wealth and, and export labor to uh outside of the imperial core and he was like oh it, 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 it's not it's not that it's not that uh, uh complicated you making it sound like you're a conspiracy theorist and it's like no i'm not i'm actually uh, this is actually like quite simple i know it's like a little a bit of a difficult concept but like no th there is a huge imperial alliance that is that is oppressing the rest of the world um so yeah that's i think that's one of the challenges right that's one of the challenges um and again there are there are people who are like the, the, there's like a, a varied amount of people that, that use the word tanky, right? When when people start to talk about things like this, like about China and about Cuba, you've got people who are very well-meaning and they're just very scared that like, oh, well, this person's kind of, kind of they kind of like China. So like, that's scary. So I'm just going to like stay away from them. But then you've got like, obviously people who are, violently opposed to any kind of leftist uh, at all so if they see anything like anyone mentioned in china or cuba they'll be like authoritarian stalin so th I, these are the things to consider in like i guess i guess if we want to get a broad audience of people trying our best to make these uh these topics digestible and, and uh, and informed because I think at the end of the day we can get we can get carried away quite a lot with like what our role is. I've been talking about this quite a lot with with the union. Uh, we could get very carried away in what our role is in in the imperial core because there are a lot of challenges here, right? We we have to dismantle white supremacy. We have to dismantle the patriarchy. We have to dismantle uh, you know anti queer sentiments. We have to dismantle uh, you know capitalism. There's, there's there's all these different things that are like fundamentally th this is the place where they originate from. And so um, we I think we have to remember to a degree that our, our function here is as if we're talking about any kind of like revolutionary action, we have to cause rot within the imperial core. Like it is, it is our duty to at least inspire a few people to understand uh, what is actually going on. Um, and so like considering ethical like uh, leftist reporting, um, what do you think like the... Um, where where do you where do you think it should be like strongest? Because you mentioned about uh you know talking about how China is actually doing stuff uh with regards to climate change and you know you can also report on Cuba for example like Cuba like passed one of the most amazing um pro queer pro woman pro family uh, bills a, a couple of years ago or a year or so ago. Um, where do you think that like leftist reporting needs to be strongest um in order to like fulfill that role of causing rot within? the imperial core i and this is one of the most difficult things but like i unironically think one of the best things to do is to kind of point out some of the good things that socialist countries around the world are doing and like opening that dialogue um mainly because it shows people a that a better world is possible and b undermines a lot of united states foreign policy right because even though we don't really live in like a democracy and they're going to do whatever they want foreign policy wise anyway, like we would be living in a very different world 
if the president of the United States thought that there was like broad, widespread support for like a war with China, right? We would just live in a different world. And so the more we can do to point out the realities of the situation, I think the better. And the problem with that is that it takes, I think it actually takes two things. I think it takes good shit posting. <laughs> um, and the best example I can think of with that is TikTok, right? Where you have like really nice big Twitter accounts that would make fun of like, I don't know if you all remember Juniper, um, yeah. who's like, you know, four new accounts deep because Elon Musk keeps like getting salty at her and making fun of him. Um, but like, you know, she was one of the people that was like making fun of conservatives for freaking out about TikTok. Um, and they're like, oh, TikTok is a, is a Chinese spy app. And it's like, okay, but what is TikTok doing that's different than any other social media website, right? Like nothing. And so making fun of things like that. Um, well, also on the other side, um, looking at like um, the way the United States is talking about Taiwan and like saying things like, for example, like, oh, China's flying jets through Ta Taiwan's air defense zone. And it's like, Okay, well, let's look at a map of where is the air defense zone. And you realize like it literally cuts into mainland China. And it's like, huh, so China's flying jets over like their own country. Amazing. You know, not to mention the fact that like, you know, I mean, the whole discussion about like people who unironically think that Taiwan is a country and like, I don't know, like, so but like things like that, pointing out like some of these like obvious things that just kind of like they crack the glass a little bit about like the mythology that the United States has built around all of these things. Um, and I think that's one of the more important things to do, mainly because the less seriously people take politicians in the United States and some of these big journalists, the less seriously they take these people who insist that they are serious, the more those people who demand, you know, to be seen as serious, smart people will sort of corn cob. They will corn cob about it and spiral into oblivion and they will make themselves look like clowns and look like fools as they deny obvious truisms. The truth is, though, it is kind of hard to find things that will resonate with people that <laughs> um, that land. And so the other side to the coin then is like you have the shit post to get people to take the, you know, politicians and journalists less seriously. But then you also have the serious, in-depth, real journalism that focuses on truth and is a lot less concerned about appearances to actually share facts, right? Going in and doing like a deep dive in the history of like Taiwan, for example, going in and doing like a deep dive explanation of like Cuba's political system or talking about like, you know, actually talking about Israel and Palestine, actually talking about these things and sort of pointing out how they're all tied together. Um, because like on the front of the conspiracy theory of it all, it's not that really controversial to say that if you're somebody like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos and you're like a billionaire, you're not just invested your money in one company. You have invested in every company. And so, yeah, like billionaires are going to have a financial interest, all a shared financial interest in making sure that oil companies keep making a profit or that defense contractors keep making a profit because their money is all in the same pot. You don't need a conspiracy when all of their money is in the same pot. Um, and so like getting that point across and then, you know, sort of like fracturing people's beliefs in like the standard lines that America says about, you know, different countries, I think is like, the 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 power couple of getting people to realize that maybe socialism is good actually and we, maybe we should give it a try this is something that um you know fuck him but bernie sanders i think did a really good job in um bernie sanders sucks as we all know because he showed his full deck with regards to uh israel and palestine but what he did was he did poke a lot of holes in the narrative of what capitalism brings us um, he helped to denormalize the idea that capitalism is is obviously the best thing ever and helped to normalize, in my opinion, kind of didn't fairly represent, but still, regardless, normalize the term socialism. And for a lot of us, helped us to, ra you know, radicalized us and got us on the path that now we can look back and be like, no, Bernie's no longer for me. But what you're talking about is like this 
this shattering of these of these myths that we've all been brought up with that we've never really thought to question that someone pulls it out even shows it to you one right because sometimes these things are just embedded in our environment we don't even talk about them right um but one shows it to you and two uh scrutinizes it and pokes holes in it and shows better alternatives and planting those seeds is really powerful like I God, I'm thinking of like all this liberal media that I used to consume. Um, but some of it actually does have some like good points. I remember seeing a it was so ancient, but an interview between AOC and uh Brianna Joy Gray, I believe. Right, ancient shit. But I remember AOC was talking about planting seeds and how you can say something to someone in a conversation, and you know, if you're discussing something that you don't agree with the other person on say something that maybe will challenge their worldview, but don't necessarily look for a result immediately. Right. Like, cause a lot of these things require some marination time. It requires you to very rarely do we go, Oh, my entire worldview is now changed. Thank you. Right. Usually we need some time. We need some extra, like let things simmer and to maybe have more exposure to maybe more people that are consistently also poking holes into that worldview, you know? Yeah, no, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. I agree with you. You are correct. Number one, 100%, A+. Plus. I feel very lucky that I had the platform that I did when I was at TYT, because one of the things that, like, one of the things, at least on, on, in terms of the deep dive front, was I basically spent two hours one day explaining the political system, like the electoral system of China, um to like their entire chat and it was like a slow process because people will say oh but benny bad things happen in china but they're like did you know that and it's like well okay but like they're a country right like any country is gonna have bad things and you know like we live you know if we have you know what says it's a democracy here and like look at all the things that are happening do you all agree with all the things that are happening here it's like no and it's like okay well like yeah so i'm a prison abolitionist china has a prison system that's bad but also, like, once again, in any democratic system, you're going to have good things and bad things. And basically, I spent like two hours explaining about like, why? No, they're a normal country. China's a normal country. And all of the things that you're running around saying are like dystopian 1984 are things that not only exist in the United States and the Western world, but actually are far worse here. Um, and those are the things that they take time to let people cook on and then sit on. But hopefully, if you've planted those seeds effectively, it will change the way they view everything else when they hear more news. Then all of a sudden, when they hear a news story about a billionaire getting arrested in China, instead of turning around and being like, this is 1984, they will turn around and laugh and be like, yeah, I actually don't care that a billionaire got arrested in China. They were probably arrested for a good reason. You know what I mean? Like, those are the things that just take like a lot of like effort to get people to that point. And it's not about like, you know, viewing the world in black and white, but just from the other side, it's about being able to see the world for what it is, which is the whole, we live in a society of it all. Yeah. Um, earlier you mentioned TikTok and you mentioned it in just like, yeah, the standard way that, you know every, everybody's talking about tiktok oh my god yeah you know it's so bad it's from china it's uh but it's just a, a social media app right um uh, but i wanted to talk about tiktok in specific with with relation to leftist uh media and how it can um change the narrative and and help us in in sort of seizing the means of of communication um because what we're seeing on tiktok specifically has been i think um quite quite important in, in the recent uh, genocide going on in Gaza, uh, in, in Palestine, because, you know, we're, we're seeing like loads and loads and loads and loads of creators who are like just coming across, uh, you know, a video of an IDF soldier blowing up a school and smiling about it. And then, you know, looking at these, like, uh, uh, what do they call it? Like the, the, the IDF girls, gun girl influencer, like, uh, the baddie IDF uh, uh, kind of accounts and like going like, wait, 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 but, but these, these guys are like just killing children, you know, um, and doing like a lot of reporting about that. That was, that was huge. Um, 
sort of around November, December time. And that's when a lot of accounts started just getting like kind of blocked, just kind of, just kind of like shadow banned and stuff like that. So because what we're seeing in, with TikTok is is individual reporting because you can, yeah, you can have stuff on Twitter. You can like, uh, uh, you know, I guess like you could take videos on your phone and upload it to Twitter or whatever. Uh, but Twitter was already like kind of a very established, um, quite oppressive when it comes to leftist reporting and stuff like that. Um, and it, well, it's gotten worse now, obviously. Um, but TikTok is quite an interesting one because it's like, well, you know, they're not so interested in trying to suppress anti-imperialist sen sentiments. Um, but when it comes to, you know, uh, getting pressure from outside sources, they obviously had to do a lot of shadow banning. So what do you think about, like, uh, not just TikTok in itself with, uh, uh, um, you know, its potential, but also, like, the 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 potential of individualist reporting, not individualist, sorry, that's the wrong word, individual reporting and individual evidence-based uh you know just posting because that essentially it's like you've got the shit posting and then you've got well the posting that is actual information that we can report on um what do you think about the potential of that in helping leftist reporting yeah i mean i think tiktok has a couple of advantages uh, one of the big advantages is that it doesn't really have this like it does have a western bias mainly because like most of the users on like our version of tiktok are obviously in the united states and europe but it doesn't have the same degree of western bias as like other platforms like twitter do and we talk about like oh well the internet is global facebook is definitely not global facebook is your little local bubble with maybe a few strangers that you met that you know you went to college with a long time ago or something like that twitter is a little bit more global but it mostly like is centered around the hubs of like a few influential like media figures and journalists and celebrities that are all mostly in the united states tiktok the algorithm is so random it almost doesn't matter who you are following and you can see this like most clearly when it comes to music where you will see some random like vietnamese artist that all of a sudden explodes in america um because like they just had one song that was a really popular TikTok sound and then everybody was using it. Now all of a sudden everybody's listening to somebody that nobody knew in the middle of a country halfway around the world before. And you have a net like a, a network like that that is more global. And then all of a sudden, you know, something like, you know, what happens with, you know, Israel doing its most recent invasion of Palestine. And now all of a sudden that global network kind of comes to action and starts to reveal these atrocities. And you have people outside of the United States that are talking about what's happening without the sort of blinders of being in the United States, without the blinders of like doing nothing but seeing at most like the New York Times stories about what's going on. And then looking at, well, what is the New York Times saying and seeing how different these things are and then being like, wait a minute, why is the story that I've been getting so different from this and then actually seeing the videos of the atrocities and watching i mean especially like like let's be real i think one of the most damning things that we saw was all of the people in israel who are celebrating the idf and bragging about having running water and like laughing about like school children not having food in palestine like we all saw those videos and it's it's hard to be like, ah, yes, these are the heroes in this situation, the people laughing at dying school children. And those circulated all over the place. And so, yeah, I think because TikTok is just raw, unfiltered emotion and reaction to what is going on in the ground, and it's coming from perspectives that most Americans are not used to seeing, it is kind of waking people up, at least in this specific context. In this specific story, it is is very rapidly shifting because a lot of these people aren't even journalists they're just people who, who like care yeah and and that's that's another thing you know what you said specifically like uh about the the, the algorithm being so random um but then it can also be very specific depending on what kind of stuff you are actually liking and engaging with um like one one account that just came up out of fucking nowhere uh a few weeks ago for me was like literally an elderly chinese woman uh just dressed in like communist 
clothing with with like a, a a little stick and she's like doing all this like military drills and shit and it's like holy fucking shit you would never you would just never see that you know obviously there were people in the comments saying like stupid shit about her and stuff but there are also people being like yeah this this woman really loves communism she's like so into it um and you just wouldn't fucking like find that shit on on facebook like you say or or, or twitter or whatever um and it and it's such a, a really like bizarre thing when some of the most some of the most famous people doing live streams on tiktok are like just like generic trashy like with all due respect in the world i fucking love trashy british people like i'm one of them in it do you know what i mean like that's why my background is what it is but you know just like trashy british people who are just sat in on a saturday night before they, they go out just getting wasted and they're just saying nothing they're just listening to tunes and it's like this rocks actually it's completely new it's it's weird and it's and it's interesting uh so yeah like in in terms of like finding stuff that you're just not gonna see um i agree i, I think i think it's got such a, an interesting uh, it well it's had it's had an interesting effect on on what's um the 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 narrative around around uh the the recent genocide in in Gaza and palestine um and so how that how that's going to go forward i think is going to be really interesting so um yeah and 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 you know what what are, i think the biggest question that we have to ask ourselves again is if what we're doing here is is trying to seize the means of communication we have to think about every avenue that's open to us and so tiktok is one of them right you know you could just like start a tiktok channel if you're watching this you know you could just you could just start a tiktok account and start you know, talking about things that you might have learned by listening to this interview with Benny, or like, you know, you can do some more research into some of those things and start reporting yourself. Like, I think that, I think that people really have to understand that, you know, if we want to be doing ethical journalism on the left, we just have to be talking about stuff that um, is, is actively making people's lives better. Right. That's always been our, uh, ethos on red planet you know we, we we spoke about diy hrt because if you're in a state where you can't get hrt yes that is like something that is necessary um and you know dis distributing uh covid masks and and uh you know various different fans that will like you know protect people uh from covid uh with like filters on and stuff like that and then of course like you know direct action stuff um and anyone could just go ahead and do that. We're always saying, like, you know, please go and start your own Red Planet. Just go and start your own, your own, your own TikTok where you're just talking about this stuff. Um, and so, you know, what we want to get out of it is, um, is we want to cause that rot within the Imperial Core. We want to, like you say, we want to shatter that glass um, of, of, I guess, us looking out into the world and having this veneer of. Uh, nonsense and and uh, you know reactionary propaganda about countries outside of the imperial core, um, and so where where do you think we're at right now? Because <clears throat> you know when <laughs> when we started uh, Red Planet, uh, fucking two years ago now, um, it was very much like we thought like are, are we really the only people doing this? Are we really the only people trying to do like a show about direct action and uh, people actually doing organizing and stuff? Uh, but I think it's definitely progressed since then. So where do where do you think it's at? Like if we're talking about true like ethical leftist reporting, like what what kind of stage are, are we at? Do you think? I think we we're in an interesting place because we are both nearing a tipping point and also at a time when working the media is about as hard as it's ever been. Um, you know, you see all these big media companies that are doing layoffs. You see a lot of big YouTubers that are basically quitting YouTube right now. Um, and that's happening for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, but basically you see algorithmically YouTube really pushing this Andrew Tate type of nonsense. You see this big reaction to what is happening. Um, and the reaction comes from two fronts. Um, one front is like, obviously people are worried about like, oh my goodness, everybody's catching on to like, uh, you know, this whole like socialism thing, not being like as bad as we said it was this whole time. Um, and then I, another part of the reaction is a lot of people who sort of during COVID came to the realization of how messed up the world actually is, and then kind of got tired and they're like, ooh, I'm a little tired of this. Like, yeah, climate change is dooming us all and capitalism is horrible and all of these things. But like, that's like a little exhausting to be like focusing on all the time. Um, and so 
that has kind of led to like some big catastrophic problems within the media space. Um, and so it's, it's one of the hardest times to be in the media, but also these ideas are a lot more popular, but also there's a weird backlash to these ideas. And then you sort of combine all of those and the question becomes, okay, well, where does it go from here? And it's kind of put us in this interesting situation, at least as we come up to the next election of the Republicans focusing on things that genuinely no one cares about. Their main issue right now is literally bullying transgender children. I mean, that's it. Their whole platform is built around bullying trans children um, to the point where, I mean, literally, you know, at least I think, right, uh, you have big accounts on Twitter uh, harassing trans children and creating an environment um, where it literally led to... Um, uh, yeah, a young, a young trans teenager, um, literally, literally like being killed. Right. Um, and so we're in this situation where it feels like the right is getting smaller, but louder and more dangerous. There's a growing faction of people who are tired and just want to care and pay attention less, but then the people who do care and are paying attention more are kind of starting to catch on but there is still this fear, I think, that a lot of people have. There is still this fear um, that a lot of people have of like, well, what would socialism actually look like? What would it actually mean if the world were to change for the better? And a lot of people, I think, are genuinely afraid of it still. And so it, it's hard to balance these out. I mean, I still get called a tanky all the time by like random people on the internet, which is like really funny um, to me, but it's also kind of sad because... I feel like even when it comes to like, you know, people who will say nice things about China, I'm not even anywhere near the top of the list. Um, and like, that's just one of those things that it gets tricky, right? It gets tricky because the people who do care don't want to be written off as like extremists. But the reality is the situation that we're in is extreme. We are in a position where right-wingers want to criminalize the existence of trans people and redefine womanhood to be so strict and narrow that it is quite literally putting many people's lives in danger, not just trans women. Because, you know, I hate to break it to, you know, everybody out there, but there are more clocky cis women than there are clocky trans women, okay? Like, I this is just real. There's way more cis women than there are trans women. And like right wing's definition of, you know, what passes as as, you know, being a woman is so incredibly narrow and rigid that mo like a lot of cisgender women don't meet that test either. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of people whose lives are being put in danger. And so I think we're at a breaking point. I think we're at a tipping point. I think everything that's happening now where we are in this stark position where most people are not believing the lie about, you know, the Israel-Palestine uh, situation where people are like, you're calling it this conflict, but it literally just like a one-sided genocide. Why do you keep just calling it a generic conflict? You see people like Joe Biden basically have no support, um, even from people who are going to vote for him because they don't want to support somebody who's going to put like trans people in camps or anything like that. And so... I think I think we're at a breaking point and the volume has turned up on everything. The people who want to be apathetic are like like burying themselves in the sand. Um, the people who are hateful are like turning the volume up to like 11 on being hateful um, and targeting people. And the people who care, I think, still have a little bit of fear of just saying what needs to be said um, and, and getting involved in the ways that they, they need to, but are starting to come to the realization that, wait, Maybe socialism is good, actually, and I guess maybe we should organize around this. Um, and so, I don't know. I'm hoping that the media space shifts a lot more. I'm hoping that people become more comfortable just taking the right less seriously. I'm hoping that people stop playing this game of, I'm a smart person, so I don't need to listen to marginalized people. I'm hoping that that is where things go using trans people as like a sort of like canary in the coal mine it's not super uh hopeful for me in some ways because you do have like some of the big number one allies that still kind of aren't really listening to trans people every like you know i mean <laughs> and that's one of those things where 
it just becomes sort of difficult because I there's still that that sort of fear. And so I wish I had a more solid position. I'm like, where I think we're going. I think we're kind of going the right direction, but it is not it is not a linear path. And um it is it is not really a clear path either. I think there's a lot of stutters and hiccups that we're going through on the way. And I just kind of hope that people catch up as fast as the right is moving, because the right has a tendency to move far ahead of where we're at and you know, push against what people aren't even pushing for yet. I think that was a really good answer, even though you said, you know, you weren't sure about it and stuff. I think you're absolutely spot on. And I think, um, well, you know, like we, we were talking, I was talking earlier about like what, you know, the, the ethos of Red Planet was always like, you know, we, we have to seize the means of communication and we have to make people understand why socialism is good why building socialism is good why dismantling uh systems that oppress us is going to be good and not only not only good but possible um and and fun actually on on the way um so you know in terms of reporting about propaganda of the deed i think these are the most this this is the most important thing to do we must amplify um you know activist groups who are helping trans kids get healthcare that they need or helping trans people like get, um, you know, to a safe place in the country somewhere, uh, or at the very least resisting, uh, you know, fascist uh, attacks, violence and stuff like that. I think that these, this is the really important stuff because once people know that it's happening, then it, there's like a light bulb that goes off in their head. I mean, th this is what happened with me. Um, and sort of doing this this show and then going and, and organizing with uh, the tenants union it's like well you know what i've what i've seen is that actually when we collectively challenge a landlord not only can we stop someone from going homeless but we can also get them thousands of pounds uh <laughs> and get get their houses repaired you know just by like applying a bit of pressure and we're not even we're not even a big union you know it's uh, it's really interesting i think that so at the, after the all member meeting yesterday with GMTU, I was speaking to some of my comrades and um, we were talking about a town that is uh, in, in the north of Manchester called Middleton. And it's actually like we're, we're in a really unique place in Manchester where we're not totally gentrified yet. They're trying to turn us into London. Um, and that's why we're resisting a lot of gentrification here. And um, so in Middleton, it is basically the same town that is all over the UK. Uh, and what I mean by that is it, it's majoritively uh, white working class people and they're in social housing, they're in council houses, and there are also, there is also an influx of migrants and, uh, you know, probably ex-prisoners, um, you know, other, other kinds of people that are like sort of being, uh, you know, put into these areas because obviously that's where the system is, is going to put them and stuff. Um, and I think sometimes that's done like a little purposefully to, to reinforce uh, right-wing narratives about like, you know, migrants stealing our, our homes and stuff. Um, and the, the, if we can, if we can like actively report on successful tenant union organizing, sorry, tenants union organizing in those areas where we have a collaboration of migrants and white working class people where the white working class people go actually these guys aren't getting better houses than us and we have like a lot of the same issues um and if we come together we can like challenge our social housing landlord and actually get a lot of results and then everyone's happy and you know we have a good we have a good life um reporting on those kinds of um sort of success stories as and where we we hear of them i think are, are so incredibly powerful and, and awesome um, that that's where we have to focus a lot of what we're doing, uh, you know, in terms of reporting and stuff, because it's, um, it's one thing to, uh, you know, break down these ideas, these ideologies, because, you know, it's very sort of like, uh, ideology based, a lot of the reporting that happens specifically on the right, you know what I mean? It's not very like, well, even liberal, even liberal reporting, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it lacks materialism, right? This is the, this is the fundamental Im important thing. Like no one is really talking about, um, how people should be paid more when, when, when people are reporting on strike action, they're, they're just saying like, oh, these lefty communists, they just want, they, they don't want to do anything. Uh, but you know, the answer to that should be, uh, well, doing nothing would be really great, actually. I mean, it's probably possible if we if we organize society <laughs> to be able to, like, you know, cater for everybody's needs. Um, 
but you know so i think i think that 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 propaganda of the deed is really important um and with that comes like these new types of reporting like i was saying uh you know you've got you've got like tiktok you've got individual streamers you've got individual influencers who are like uh you know changing the narrative around all all kinds of stuff uh and of course like you know journalists on the ground in 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 Gaza like this is this is a huge thing you know journalists on the ground in Gaza who like you might have like read one of their Mondo Weiss pieces um or you might have like read something in the electronic intifada but even then like you would have to like be uh you know a pro palestine uh uh you know supporter for for a long time to 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 know about these uh, these news outlets kind of thing and just having that that variety in reporting capability has been so important uh, and so i think what we have to what we have to also think about now is like obviously we've got this stream you know we've got our, our own personal streams and we've got podcasts and stuff like that but there's also there's also a lot of other things that that can be done right so zines uh you know uh, graffiti is technically a form of propaganda right you know what i mean and then you've also got um art and culture that has um these kinds of messages and this kind of uh, uh propaganda of the deep message in that as well so uh what do you think about like different types of reporting i don't know if this is something you thought about before and it's okay if you haven't but um you know different types of of, of reporting um like for example you know if if someone decides to like just make a zine and leave it in like a toilet in a queer bar or something you know where it's like not necessarily a radical queer bar but like a bit lib uh you know well honestly okay so like oh there's so many layers to this but i guess i'll start from the position of there's something that is like that i call social truth which is like a lot of people believe a lot of things but act in different ways because they believe in like a social truth so for example why does it feel like homophobia magically vanished between 2011 and like 2014 well because as soon as the supreme court made gay marriage legal the default social truth became it's weird to be homophobic because there are a lot of people who behaved in homophobic ways and said homophobic things, not because that's what they actually believed, but because that's what they thought they were expected to say and believe. And so what you mentioned with like graffiti and like random things like around town that signal one political view or another, that creates a social truth where if you live in an area and there's just kind of random stickers and, you know, paintings and um, you know, zines are like all these random things, all this propaganda that's just like, yeah, socialism is cool. Yeah, trans people are cool. Yeah, all of these things. People will assume the default position is supporting trans people um, or supporting Palestine. Like, for example, you know, like I've been to a lot of queer bars where there's like you go to the bathroom and all of a sudden there's like a bunch of pro-Palestinian graffiti all over the walls. And it's like, cool, I'm in a cool space and most people here are going to be supportive of Palestine, and somebody is going to be treated weirdly if they say anything against Palestinians. And that's just, like, good on its face. And then to tie it into, it's because it's very related, actually, to what you're talking about with the stories of, like, you know, uh, forming attending, attendance unions and, and getting one over um, on these, like, landlords and stuff. It is a way in which people feel powered. Because, honestly, one of the first steps to like becoming empowered as like working class people is you have to feel empowered first. If you don't feel empowered, if you feel helpless, you're not going to do anything. And so quite literally doing things that like laughing together at rich people, laughing together at these politicians, laughing together at these journalists who are dishonest in their coverage because they want to give credence to the right, laughing together at them is a way to make people realize they're part of a community and feel empowered um in order to get engaged and so telling people victory stories of tenants unions is a way for people to you know feel empowered and and sort of laugh at people in positions of power and the same thing with the graffiti it makes people who have these beliefs who do actually want to do and say the right things it makes them feel more empowered to do so um and that is kind of where like you know i'll say virtue signaling actually has a certain degree of value because the more centrists feel like they have to support trans people because that's the popular thing, the more people who actually support trans people will actually be willing to say it and be upfront about it. The same thing with like people who support Palestine. There are a lot of people, right, 
who were very displeased with the way Israel has been treating Palestine this whole time, but were afraid to say it. They knew what the right answer was, but they were afraid to say it because they were like, oh, well, if I criticize Israel, then I'm going to be co called an anti-Semite. And just look at, you know, years ago with J Jeremy Corbyn and the way that that happened, right? And so, like, so like this is one of those things where like changing the social truth allows people who are already believing the right things to actually say it. Because the truth is more people understand socialism than they realize. More people have like an understanding of capitalism than they realize. More people understand oppression than they realize. It's just they need to be given permission societally to say it. And so that's where like Shit posters laughing at people in power and people forming tenant unions share that commonality of getting working class people to realize that we are collectively empowered. And the people who are spreading like racism and misogyny um, and imperialism and all these things are actually a very small minority of people. They just happen to be powerful. And we actually collectively are more powerful than them. We just have to feel it first. And so that is where I think a lot of the reporting should focus on is making people feel empowered and willing to laugh at these people and not feeling the need to perform intelligence, right? Because ultimately, smartness or intelligence or whatever you call it is a performance that people play to cater to white supremacist patriarchal norms. It's not actually you know, oh, somebody truly being a brilliant mind. It is a, it is a performance. Same with the uh, affinity toward like rash, being rational and being correct. It's not just intelligence as a category. Like, it's also a specific form of intelligence that that is that is a value by white supremacist patriarchy. And you were talking about this earlier with this. Like, it, it's it's actually really funny how it demonstrates itself because it's. It's both trying to show itself as rational, but also rejecting the basic truths of the world that we see. And it's a really, it's really amazing when you see those contradictions very sharpened. And we're seeing those contradictions sharpened, like uh, especially with like Israel, uh, Israel's war on Gaza. We're seeing more and more like the painfully clear evidence of what's going on and how these so-called rational actors, these like fence straddlers that like to think of position themselves as like the arbiters of of logic are having a really hard time continuing to play that role um but no you're 100 right like it, it's really disgusting how how much this is this this like boner for this re like this new atheist kind of type of person is very much just a. Uh, just worshiping white supremacist patriarchy. Sorry to cut you off, but I just want to make sure I mention that because the, you're absolutely right. No, no, you're fine. And I like, you know, feel free to cut me off because I, <laughs> I have a tendency to ramble because ultimately, yeah, that is it is it's pointing out that this is white supremacist patriarchy and people find new ways to frame it because obviously like not to say that Christianity isn't in anymore, but the specific flavor of like right wing anti communist evangelicism that was very big during the McCarthy era just isn't as big now. And so now they're trying to invent this sort of like secular spin on, well, what if liberalism itself was our religion? And that's where you get people like Nate Silver, for example, who they they hide behind things like data, you know. They, they, they hide behind things like data and they say they're being analytical and objective when in actuality, they are just spinning the same white supremacist myths about the world and just trying to, you know, explain how it's this, the galaxy brain strategic rational way to think. And that's, you know, to take it back to Jenk and TYT and their takes on trans people. He literally had to walk his opinion back down to, oh, well, if you say the true things about trans people, you're not going to win over voters. And that's what it's all about. It's all about winning over voters. It's definitely not about being truthful or anything like that. And that's where you see the lie, because these people refuse to admit that they create social truth by being people in the media. They want to say that they're responding to the way people are feeling, but in actuality, they're trying to create a feeling of reality around people that supports this white supremacist patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Well, I also, uh, like you're mentioning right now, the, the dark side of the social truth, because before you were talking about the positive sides of it, you know, the way that we can manipulate it uh, to the, for the benefit of, of trans rights and, and um, you know, 
Palestinian rights and, and so on and so forth. But there is also that dark side. Um, and this is the way that I see figures like Donald Trump, right? Um, Trump's presidency was really harmful, not specifically for his policies, because his policies were fucking horrible, right? But Biden's continuing those policies. And those policies are bad. But I still think that Trump has a certain amount of harm associated with him that's above and beyond someone like Biden because of the normalization of so much bigotry that that he was able to um, create because of his position, being you know having a loudspeaker to his mouth effectively. And the way that I always thought about it was like, like okay, so like pretend you're in class and the teacher has an assignment that's there's like there's this big project that's due on Friday. And it's Thursday and you don't have it done yet. And you're panicking. You're panicking, you're panicking, but you don't say anything about it because you feel like it's your, it's your particular shame. It's your particular burden that you have to deal with on your own. But then imagine somebody else in that same class stands up and goes, excuse me. Um, I actually have no way of finishing this project by tomorrow. I'm like really behind because of other assignments that you've been giving us. Can we get an extension? Now, all of a sudden, you feel way more empowered. Like, I also would like to have an extension if that's okay. And all of a sudden, everyone who's behind feels way more empowered to stand up and say something, right? Because now you have that, that, that kind of community, effectively, that has just been created with the shared you know, vulnerability that you have, this shared burden. And while that can be really powerful in helping to make people feel liberated in good ways, I think that that liberation can be very harmful when it's when it's something like, you know, the liberation you feel when you can finally be racist to the people that you've been wanting to be racist to or whatever, right? Like, so that's why I feel like figures, like fascist figures, uh, and by the way, this is not me endorsing Biden as president. I want to get extremely clear. I'm not trying to say that everyone should go vote for Joe Biden. What I'm trying to say, though, is that I do think there's a certain harm associated with certain figures having a lot of uh, having a substantial platform. And it's it's and they have an enormous amount of power and they do create those truths and they can help make they can help to liberate really bad things and help to embolden really bad things and help to oppress the things that we're trying to actually promote, like trans rights, for instance. Oh, a hundred percent. And that's actually, this is quite literally why right-wingers do hate crimes. Like the reason why people on the political right do hate crimes is because they not only want to make people of the marginalized group afraid, but they also want to make potential allies afraid of being supportive. And that's why you'll have people who are like, okay, so for example, right, if you are a straight man and you have a friend who is a trans woman, there are a lot of like right wing freaks who are going to start trying to spin some nor sort of narrative first and foremost about you being gay, because like, of course, these people are homophobic and they think that being gay is something to be ashamed of, but also as like some sort of like sexual deviant or something like that, because the reason why they do that, not only to like trans people, but also to people who just hang out with trans people is because they want to make people afraid of even being supportive of trans people. And this is the same thing that is like true with a lot of different political issues. And it's why people on the right do hate crimes and do literal violence against, you know, not just members of marginalized community, but also people who are around them because they want people to be afraid to voice support. And so they know they're an extreme minority. They know they're an extreme minority, but they put in an extreme amount of effort to create social truth, to commit acts of violence against people who are, who are actually speaking you know, in favor of marginalized people, who are speaking the true things about like American foreign policy and stuff like that. The reason why they commit direct violence against us is because they want potential allies to be afraid. They want to force people to be fence sitters. They want to force people into silence and they want to create an artificial social truth where an extreme violent minority scares away most morally decent people from saying anything because they don't want themselves to be targeted. They don't want their families to be targeted. And then that is what leaves trans people out in the open to be victimized. And unfortunately, most of the Democratic Party are fundamentally cowards. They are afraid to support trans people because they don't want to be called a groomer by these right wingers that literally support child marriage because they don't have the confidence to just say, well, how dare you call trans people groomers when we just want children to be happy and be themselves and you are literally de defending child marriage. And that's why it's so important to like constantly be dunking on these reactionaries because 
if people feel like the popular opinion is that right wing like nonsense, they will be afraid to speak up for what they know to actually be true. And so, yeah, you're 100 percent right where the right weaponizes so social truth, honestly, more than the left does. And that's why I think the left like it's important that we per like we should to a certain degree, pretend as though everybody agrees with us, at least when we're making fun of right wingers, we should make it obvious and act as though we are assuming that everybody's on the same page as us in, on, in some way, because if you go in thinking, well, I know most people don't support trans people, but we have to have this. No, you got to be like, no, you're attacking trans people because you're a weird, obsessive little freak and something's wrong with you here. OK, no, it's I have like. I 100% agree with you. Like, like talking to right now, I'm like dating. And so I'm like navigating that whole, you know, you don't know what people really believe in. And like, I would, I'm really sick and tired of like having to quiz people straight up right away. And I don't really think it's even like particularly good praxis because like, I don't want to, I don't like this like disposability mindset where people are just like thrown away. Like, I, I like to, I'm trying not to do that. It's really easy. It's very much encouraged by the internet to just like, Put, throw people like human beings away as if like you know it's just I think it's disgusting right um so I'm trying to approach these conversations as if obviously they should agree with me and wait what you don't oh you know like make them feel like a fucking freak for it make them feel like a freak if they if they don't think there's a genocide happening be like you you don't wait you don't you don't think like trans people should should have rights what the f okay um like make them and that's a seed that you plant right like they don't get to date me and they also feel like a freak in that interaction and maybe they'll have a little less confidence with their shitty opinion and maybe even rethink it and what you were saying before about like how democrats are cowards i don't think democrats think of themselves as cowards and i think that's pretty important because if they're acting as cowards but they are convincing themselves that they're not cowards how is that how is that congruency created how are they able to live with themselves well, they live with themselves by not committing their cowards, but by thinking that they have a actually really morally good reason to do the thing they're doing. And that's when the rationalizations for fucking rat, like uh, reactionary perspectives come into hand. Right. That's when you see so-called progressives rationalizing right wing perspectives because they are they cannot live with the reality that they are, in fact, cowards and bending the knee to the right. So yeah, I 100% agree with you. You're right again, 100%. A plus. And it's I don't want to I don't want to denigrate. Uh, well, what's the word? I don't want to I don't want to offend my mother on Mother's Day. But we were talking about this literally before the show about so some of her more um, economically conservative positions. Like she was trying to say to me that like oh uh, this Tory MP was uh, saying that there are that people aren't having children anymore and. It's because people uh, aren't going to work when they're 16. And I was like, I just laughed at her. I just like that, that. I just couldn't actually help it. I didn't do it on purpose. It was like, this is just so reactionary and incorrect. And she got so mad and she does normally get mad. She, she just, she was just like, uh, you know, oh, of course you're right. I'm wrong. And I was like, yeah, I am like, <laughs> like, what do you want? What do you want me to say? Like this, this is it. Um, but yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. They want to engage in like a, like the, the stuff that, that happens after that is that they get offended that, that you thought that their position was ridiculous. And then they try to force you into a discourse that makes it seem like they are actually reasonable. And so the, the thing that they'll do typically is they will then default to a, so are you saying that they're that that you're not in the middle somewhere? Like they try to pull you into that center position in some way because that helps to make their position not seem so laughable, right? And if you just continue to laugh, I I personally think that that's a great position to take. Oh, 100%. And especially when it comes to like very basic things, like I don't think anybody should be homeless, right? And like there are a bunch of people that will like react to that and start like, you know, spiraling <laughs> and like talking over themselves. And I'm like, so you're you're trying to justify why you think some should people should be homeless. Like, tell me about the people that you think 
deserve to be homeless. I'm so curious about this, right? Because I don't think anybody should be homeless. And then they start like rationalizing. And I actually had this happen recently where somebody was like, oh, but if we had universal housing, what if one of your neighbors is like causing a ruckus and making noise all the time or like destroying the property or something? And I'm like, I've got news for you that already exists, right? Having a for-profit housing system doesn't get rid of that. So you're going to have bad neighbors. Uh, we live in a society the world exists, other people exist, you know, we're not in the Sims. So I know I don't think anybody should be homeless. Yeah, it's also not like, so they're making a lot of noise. So therefore, they should absolutely be be homeless. Right, right. The connection there is, this is so classically liberal. Like, it's so funny. Or or, not even liberal. It's it's just reactionary and liberals are included in that. But it's so funny how they try to come up with these like little, these little edge cases. But then you like go, that still doesn't justify the thing you're saying. And and here's the unique thing, right, about socialism and what it could enable us to do. And we have to plant those seeds of like what a wonderful world socialism could be. Because imagine a reality where you're not, worried about engaging in that conflict resolution with your neighbor because neither of you are worried about getting evicted right like imagine that like you know mental space for you to be able to be like oh well actually i could get to know my neighbor um in in like a a a very nice friendly fashion because uh none of us are gonna get turfed out for for not being able to afford rent none of us are gonna get turfed out for uh you know whatever and and who knows what kind of structure that that could that could entail like you know yeah if you have a neighbor that you don't get along with because they're i don't know playing live music or something then maybe you could like say yo i i, I want to apply for like a house in the old people uh block right you know i, I don't i don't want i don't want to hear the, the loud music and then someone else who likes loud music could go and live there and it's like wow all these problems actually just get solved with socialism anyway so shut up you know you think only old people like quiet I'm old. I'm old and I love quiet. I don't I don't know what you're about. <laughs> Ancient. I'm literally decaying. Yeah, you're dying. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. But you have touched on, you see, this is why it's impossible, okay? Because Americans' greatest fear in the world is talking to their neighbors, actually. And so uh <laughs> that's that's why socialism will never win here. Because uh I mean, like, okay, there's like a whole like thing to go on about this about like cars and how I like like unironically one of the reasons why like car like centric development was sold to Americans is because like quite literally there was just a bunch of racist white people that were terrified of the prospect of walking by a black person on the street and they're like that's why we need cars everybody in their own little pods <laughs> um so wild yeah, yeah. And, it, and it genuinely like does like this is the thing I, I have a friend who's uh, uh, uh moving from Britain to America uh now and she is just like so absolutely flabbergasted with like uh you know her fiance is is like oh uh we're gonna go down to see uh my mom and she's like a a, i don't know like a seven hour drive away or whatever and it's just kind of like okay yeah so they don't have trains right and that would solve that kind of issue just like already uh, but then she was saying that like, oh yeah, so we went to go and see his mom. And then on the way back, we were stuck in traffic for three hours. So we had like the seven hour journey and then a three hour traffic jam. And I'm like, how do you even live? But it, it's literally because it's, it's you know, it's that, uh, what do you call it? that consolidation of like, uh, you know, car companies wanting to make more profits uh, and also like, yeah, keep everybody apart. Like if you have your own little personal uh little tank that you could use to to get around and escape having to have social interactions with everybody then yeah that's really cool um yeah no that makes so much sense honestly i hate car culture so much i really really I genuinely do. think we should abolish cars i wasn't actually a believer of abolishing cars until i played um uh, half earth socialism if you've not played it go and play it it's <laughs> free it's really good you could even play it on your phone um and the, the, there was this just this, this one bit and it just said abolish cars and i was like reading a bit into like the ideology of uh, well not the it's not really an ideology it's kind of it's materialistic it, it's like okay well what would we benefit from abolishing cars it's like well if we had systems of public transport that were like accessible especially to disabled people then you know cars would just be obsolete so you know it just kind of makes sense if that's the 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 direction that we're going in not only that but like cars make it so in order for you to it's like a pay to play for for life in such a profound way where so much of our landscape 
is dedicated to to car transport meaning that in order to interact with so much of our environment you have to pay money you have to pay a hefty fee and continually pay a hefty fee and have a little mini miniature house for that little vehicle too and like it's it's just it's it's so like deeply fucked actually if you really think about it, it's like deeply deeply fucked that there's so much of the, the world that i am prohibited from interacting with because i am not paying like a substantial amount of money all the time i genuinely feel this on a emotional level because i don't have a car and we have pretty good we have pretty good public transport here in the uk but like it kind of like stops outside of the big cities and so like you know mm -hmm. like today for example I, I i got in my mom's car with her to go see my gran because the public transport is just not good enough for me to be able to like do that um yeah it's it's nuts that 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 just like whole cut off that you get from the world and that must be like times 10 in america because i could get a train to go and see my gran no tra public transport is awful here literally zero right so mm -hmm. yeah so bad so yeah just kind of like to, to to wrap up the um the discussion on uh leftist media and 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 that kind of stuff um i wonder like if we could like talk just very briefly about reporting in the imperial periphery um so just kind of outside of the us the uk europe um you know new zealand australia because we have this this such a, a big stranglehold of media conglomerates and uh you know murdoch uh murdoch funded uh media all over the the imperial core that is like obviously reactionary and serves billionaires ruling class uh people and that kind of stuff ruling class interests i should say outside of of the imperial core you get this very interesting um you know amount of of, of media that is is obviously anti-imperialist right and i think that that's very much something that we should look to in terms of how we can try and gain some kind of inspiration for how we do reporting within the imperial core because i think genuinely it has to be anti-imperialist right like you spoke a lot about um china and you spoke a lot about like uh you know the the well no you don't this is the thing you don't even speak a lot about china but you spoke about china and how like uh you know it's important to like shatter that illusion and i think that really what we have to do is like get people talking about imperialism and what it is right so like one of the great uh reporting uh outlets um uh, uh, uh popular front is really good for this because <clears throat> they talk a lot about uh various different struggles um that are like armed struggles all over the world like they, they constantly talk about myanmar they constantly talk about uh palestine they constantly talk about um you know what's going on in sudan and everything and it's just very very good reporting because you can see with this on the ground reporting, the direct effects of imperialism and capitalism on these places in the world, right? So uh, I wonder if if uh, this is anything that you have, uh, well, if this is something that you have, have some experience with in like looking at reporting it from the imperial periphery. I'm going to be really honest and say that the the biggest thing that I do is I actually, I read a lot of books, right? I end up reading like a lot of books um that are written by people um who are either from other countries or have spent most of their time traveling to other countries to, like cover like things that have happened um and I feel bad because it's been a hot minute since I like I oh shoot I'm trying to remember the name of that book that was written by that guy that went to a bunch of countries that were the victim of like like extreme anti-communism and like the the different anti-communist purges um uh basically around the world and but i don't know there's like great authors like vj prashad and stuff like that um who do like a, a bunch of like analysis and historical stuff so that whenever i read news i read it through that context the main like foreign press that i read is i read like a lot of like chinese like newspapers and like chinese uh like youtube videos and stuff um mainly because they are it's really big and despite what a lot of people feel about it it's like PBS, right? Like CGTN feels like PBS where it's all very dry. Um, but that's that's kind of what I like. And so unfortunately, it's it's been a few months since I've like really dove into like various foreign presses. Um, but 
I think there's a lot of value in like reading books and getting like cultural context in history so that whenever up to date news does happen, you have like a more in depth background on what has like happened in like all these different countries around the world. And you're not surprised to like hear that like, oh, this country exists. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, I kind of depend honestly on people like you retweeting things that I, I will see in my feed um, <laughs> as a, as like my source for like news around the world. But especially like, I don't know, watching like small leftist podcasts that will like interview people um from like peru for example um when they were going through the the whole like um like tumultuous moment that they went through uh a year or two ago i don't remember exactly when that was happening um and then like you know people were talking to people who are actually like in venezuela people were talking to people who are like in all of these countries around the world um honestly and it's just like a lot of random like small youtubers that just do these like interviews and it's really cool and amazing to see um but i wish i was remembered like better at remembering people's names and like names of these different outlets i i'm the same way i always feel so bad because people are so good at like rattling off all these names and i'm like that sounds so smart it sounds so smart when you can rattle off all these authors and there's just me i'm like i read a book one time and i can tell you what's in it i can tell <laughs> you the things that i read but like, I can't, I'm not good at reciting names. And now I, I feel like I've lost like a power with that. Because people that can recite authors, they go like, that's like a smart look. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think uh, the, the, like the, the important takeaway um, is really like, it's everything that we said, everything that we've said today about like trying to trying to tell people that there is a life after capitalism. And, you know, I think that it's really pertinent what you said about the right becoming very small, but also very loud. Most people just want to like, have an okay life, I think like that that is generally like the the entirety of, um, you know, um, um, most people's wants and needs they just want to have an okay life they want to have their needs met they want to be able to uh live a life free from discrimination and whatever it, it, and and i think that it, the best way that we can that we can serve capitalism like being destroyed uh well just sort of destroying itself really because it's not sustainable um <clears throat> and and serve people wanting to know how to how to live post capital is by reporting on places like you said like like you know china not necessarily amazing not necessarily what like everybody wants but good in a lot of ways uh you know south africa same story like cuba same story vietnam same story uh and you also got like a lot of other a lot of other places like you got like the autonomous region in mexico the zapatistas you've also got the nicaragua uh autonomous region that i didn't even know existed until like a few weeks ago um you know various different places the rojava uh, uh autonomous zone as well like these are all places where people are like just living uh uh, uh according to the values that, that we all talk about like they're doing anarchism they're doing communism they're doing uh uh you know like actual humanity and and uh trying to be uh you know sustainable and as, as sustainable as possible so with that in mind, let's uh, let's launch into some questions. We don't have many, but uh, we got some. Uh, Kara, do you want to do the 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 first one? Sure. Um, the first one's from Matthew Walawango. Uh, he says, "Does the panel have any kind of leftist content that they think is not being made or is currently lacking?" So this is, I guess, this is kind of two different types of content, and it kind of exists, but not really. And I want a lot more of it um like like basically one of them is a specific flavor of tiktok that i've seen a bunch of which is basically like oh i found out this really cool thing that it like empowers people against landlords and i there was a tiktok i saw fairly recently where somebody was explaining the like housing authority um that does something with um in, in new york city about like the rent control departments and there's a housing authority that like keeps track of rent control apartments and they found out through the housing authority that they were overpaying their rent and that their landlord was lying to them um and so like content like that that shows people tools that already exist to empower themselves because that woman ended up getting thousands of dollars back from her landlord uh and her rent got reduced by a couple hundred dollars a month so things like that that are empowering 
And then like little like mini docu-series about people who are forming tenants unions like literally just like have somebody with a camera uh have somebody with a camera that's like there while things are going like you know through and just put on like a little like 20 minute youtube documentary about this is the actual nitty gritty details of like how we form this tenant union and like obviously don't release it until after y'all have done the successful action because you don't want but like you know after the successful action happens, put on the documentary and be like, this is how we did it. Here's the interviews with the people. Here's how we feel about it. And give people some of those like feel good moments of like, oh, you know, this is what we did. And th this is how we did it. Um, and now we feel really empowered. And this feels really awesome. And like little stories about like small victories that people have had, because there's not enough stories highlighting people's victories. And I know it's not clickbaity. I know it's not like a super big thing. But like, the more we can give a little bit of attention to the people who are doing the effort to win these small victories, I, I think the better. Okay, I got to hold my hands up. I got to hold my hands up on this because this is like th th absolutely what I should be doing with the tenants union. And like, I, I threw myself into like member solidarity. Um, and it is something I'm planning on doing. It is something I'm planning on doing is doing more like actual comms work. But I wanted to sort of like open um, the, the, the possibility for like other members to do that kind of stuff. But you're so fucking right. Like it, that shit is, is so, so important. Like that's that prop propaganda of the deed. Um, and I do think it's clickbaitable, honestly, like you could like a, like a title, like, uh, like we made our landlord pay $5,000 or something like that. Something that that's very like, I don't know, something that flexes super, super hard in a way that a lot of people are like, I really would love if I could make my landlord pay me five thousand dollars <laughs> or something yeah, like that. It should almost be a little smug, yeah. It should almost be like, oh yeah, how I got one over on my landlord by forming a tenants union, kind of like, yeah. Literally, landlords hate this weird, one weird trick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for real. So important. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. I think that the more propaganda of the deed, more. Um, well, it's it's like yeah, it's that it's that culture building, and it and and you know documentaries are so good. Like I'm always 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 talking about rebel D words. It's it's the D word that is is for lesbians. Um, but it's it's a really good it's a really 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 good fucking documentary about radical lesbians uh, in the UK in, in the time of Section 28 and like what they did in order to draw attention to uh, Section 28 and how harmful that that shit was. Um, and also Nay Passaran. Um, and then there's that also, there's also that French documentary, and I completely forgot what it's called, uh, but it's about anti fascists in France. And it's just literally like them talking about how they went around and beat the shit out of Nazis. And it's like, it's just so fucking good. Um, you know, and, um, and it just, it just, it's just that shit is like so, so important, I think. So yeah, I, I totally agree with everybody. Um, so the next question is from Sir D Demon, and Sir Demon asks, is there anything to take from Biden saying he has trans Americans backs and what <laughs> we should <laughs> what we should look to to make sure that LGBTQ plus people are being more widely accepted? Front of the show. There's two things to say about that. The first thing is that it is good that Biden feels that it is necessary to say that he supports trans people. That is a good thing. The other thing is, is that Joe Biden has actually done things in the past where I think he wrote some sort of executive order or something like that, that basically carved out, hey, red states, this is how you can exclude trans people from sports, even under Title IX. Um, and and so those two things exist simultaneously, um, where you, we need to push back against that. We need to stop tolerating uh the sort of like well we have to give the republican something no you don't but it is good that it is that joe biden feels that it's necessary and so basically the takeaway is we need to keep putting aggressive pressure on the democrats to support trans people we need to make sure that they feel like not fully supporting trans people is an untenable political position because we are kind of on the brink of losing that in a lot of ways. There are a lot of Democrats that are toying with the idea of taking away trans health care, at least for trans youth, because they view that as a compromise. And we can't do that, right? 
And so that's really the takeaway that it is good that they feel like it's necessary to give lip service to the trans community, but we need to actively fight to make sure that that continues to feel necessary for them. Yep, I think that's a spot on answer. Absolutely. Uh, the next one is a very difficult one, and I think maybe we might um, we might we might <laughs> collaborate on the answer because it is a really interesting one. It's a great question. It's from Wintery Mute. Um, and she says, if we are doing reporting independently as leftists without a sort of central body of authorized knowledge like the state has, how do we keep each other in check with regards to misinformation, reactionary attitudes, holding each other accountable for good journalism besides just doing social media drama? Any thoughts? Oh, that one's really tough. Um, I think the most surface layer important takeaway is that people not take themselves too seriously. And the reason why I say that is because, like I was saying way earlier in the show, is that if you think of yourself as a smart person, as your identity, you will see corrections as threats to your identity, as opposed to somebody just trying to correct you on something. Um, Tying that into the draw of like doing the clickbait, because like the reason why the debate bro streamers like explode so fast is because all of their names become keywords algorithmically. And the more they mention each other, the more attention they're going to get. And so that is a really big problem because that drama creates this conflict cycle that sort of escalates. And so people sort of get a vested interest in holding bad opinions because even if they know they're wrong, they know that being wrong will get other people to talk about them. And so that right there is a problem. Mm -hmm. I think there is something to be said about, to a certain extent, ignoring some of those people, but then there's something to be said about the need to correct very popular wrong ideas. And so I wish that I had a solid answer other than people need to take themselves less seriously. And I think taking people down a peg when they are taking themselves too seriously, when they are playing the game of I'm a strategic galaxy brain and you don't have as good of takes as me. Um, I think that is in general good, but this is, this is fighting the algorithm at this, at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know what debate bros are. I've never heard of them, and they they sound pretty bad though. Um, so I've got no experience of that. Um, but what I what I do know is that I think that if we're if we're gonna think so, you know what what we're what we're planning on doing, what what the idea of like seizing the means of communication is is about is about um, we're organizing together, right? And as leftists, there are truths that we hold to be self evident. And those truths are like quite simple, actually. It's that we want a society where everybody's needs are met and people are not being discriminated against, right? Um, and I, I think it's as simple as that. Like if, if we're opening any kind of door for uh, reactionaries within whatever, uh, you know, we talk about and whatever we report on, um, then that of course needs to be addressed. But I think we solve that by... Uh, collaborating and i think we solve that by making it a more collective process because at the moment what we've got is like everybody just like in their rooms uh with their cats going behind mule you unplugged your mic hello hello <laughs> no no i didn't it was my cat that did that and i was literally just saying yeah Everybody, every okay. So you know, so you know what we have at the moment is um, uh, uh, everybody in their uh, 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 you know, in their bedrooms, like you know, doing this stuff with their cats going behind the fucking computer and turning their shit off. Um, but like basically, um, if, if we if we have this like collective, uh, you know, uh, 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 actual like um, what do you call it? Um, collaboration where we're all we're all talking to each other we're all in co communication with each other and not just in communication with each other but also in internationalist um solidarity with each other i think that's i think that's truly the way that that we, that we resolve that because um if if we just keep individualizing leftism it is going to fail because it's just it's just not it's 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 antithetical 
to what we're trying to do, right? We're, we're trying to do collective action. We're trying to do collective organization. And so we have to like, you know, we have to have some kind of like central body of authorized knowledge to a degree. Um, you know, whether that takes the form of like a constitution that we all agree on. Um, but this is, this is like big idea stuff, right? This is, this is big idea. This is if we're like truly like seizing the mainstream media and, and, and making it leftist kind of thing. And I think for the time being, yeah, what Benny said, like about like, you know, really trying to take people down a peg or two when they're just being so confidently wrong about stuff, um, is, is the most valuable thing. Kara, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. No, I think this is a great idea. Uh, also just agree with me. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty much always right. So it's true. If everyone just agreed with me, I think this, a lot of the, like these wrinkles could be ironed out pretty quickly. We need to be confident in our values and humble in our knowledge. I think that really is where people should come from because we all think everybody deserves basic necessities, basic qualities of life. We all deserve to live in a society that is democratically organized. Um, but we all have different understandings of the world that shapes what we will say when expressing those values. And so like, as long as we are constantly confident in our values and unwavering in them, but then also humble about how much we really know about any given situation, that is the recipe I think for success. She just did it everyone. She just did a leftist ethical journalism soundbite wild it's wild that you did that and it was cool um yeah yeah for real absolutely absolutely fucking it's about it's about being open to like understanding and like learning all the time uh nature is a is a chaotic uh you know sort of you know not non well it's non-binary for sure like you know uh, uh and uh and we have to like we have to we have to keep that in our politics right we have to keep that in our in our values uh, so do you want to do the last one, Kira? Sure. Um, last one's from Ellie Simone. Like, how do we deal with comrades who don't care about trans and BIPOC issues, Palestinian issues in favor of just touching on theory and covering light current day stuff? I think that that kind of goes into the, the matter of like values, right? Because like, ultimately, if people are unwilling to accept that what we are facing is not just capitalism, but a system of capitalist white supremacist patriarchy, then they have already failed, right? Like, fundamentally, all of these things are tied in with each other, right? It is not unrelated, right? The way that patriarchy wants to, you know, force women into the role of being baby factories is not unrelated to our capitalist mode of production. There's a reason why, like, all of these core narratives, for example, of, like, the, you know, the cis-het white man that protects his family and is the king of his own miniature castle, right, that sort of popular aristocracy that exists in the United States, there's a reason why that cropped up as a cultural norm following the Industrial Revolution and, you know, the growth of capitalism, right? All of these things are fundamentally tied to each other. So when you have somebody that says, well, I support working class people, but I don't support trans people. It's like, well, I hate to break it to you, but most trans people are working class people, right? There's, you know, I don't think there's a transgender Jeffrey Bezos running around anywhere. And why do you think that is? And so ultimately, those people are just fundamentally wrong at their core. And I think are operating from a realm of primarily self-interest, right? Where they don't actually want socialism. What they want is like what something like what Norway has, right? Where if you're a marginally privileged white person, you're going to be comfortable, right? If you're, if you're on a relative scale, like privilege, you're going to be comfortable and fine and everything is hunky-dory for you. But, you know, don't think about, you know, the people working in factories, like to give you all your clothes and your cell phones. And don't think of the children, you know, working in mines or like, you know, um, uh, like, uh, Oh, what's it called? Like chocolate farms and stuff like that. Like, don't think about that. And so like, like that's kind of where those people sit, right? That's kind of where those people sit, um, where they don't want to acknowledge that other people exist in the world and everything they're doing is based out of self-interest. And so usually those people 
are very willing to embrace right-wing economic ideas, but whenever they're actually challenged on their like views on, on marginalized people. And so <laughs> that's kind of like my take is that a lot of them are just dishonest. And I think it's, it's, it's just so unbelievably funny because you're right. Like the, 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 the patriarchy is something that capitalism needs, right? It it needs it to like, actually like, you know, have this, this reproductive labor. Like one of the things that I've been ridiculed for quite uh, a lot by like some people that don't exist and I don't know who they are and I'm not saying any of their names um, is like when I spoke about reproductive labor uh, and I think a lot of people just meant like, um, they thought I meant that that was giving birth but like no, it's like a it's like a Marxist feminist, uh, uh, you know, theory um, <clears throat> where like you know women have just basically been treated as slaves and and they just have to do all the work while the man goes uh, and does all the all, all the well the the paid work basically um, and looks after the home and raises children and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's one of those. It's like you know if pe if people aren't connecting the dots, then they either seriously need to be educated if they're ignorant or uh, fuck them because they're fucking fascists really aren't they so that's that i agree kira yes all right well that's that see you later no i'm joking benny <laughs> thanks so much uh for coming on it's been really really good i'm so i'm so glad that we uh that we chatted about this stuff um we like to give our chatters homework i don't know if this was this this thing was was mentioned here uh, but do you have any homework that you would like to assign to our uh nerdy chatters they love being given homework and i'm sure like uh you know teacher miss benny uh they would they would do anything to please teacher benny uh so what what do you think what do you think is, is a good bit of homework for the for the listeners and the chatters uh today i would say Try to find like a small success story of people organizing in their communities, whether it be a tenants union or like a workers union or, you know, something, some type of like small success story that feels empowering and share it somewhere. Right. Um, and, and share it somewhere with and, and just be confident about it. Be like, oh, my God, look at this story. It's so great. Um, I would definitely love to, to see the stories that people find um, and, you know, like. I don't know if you like send it to me, I'll, I'll probably retweet it or something. <laughs> that rocks. That's really, really good. Uh, give us all your plugs. Where can we find you if we want to see more Benny? Uh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter at Benny.gay also on Twitch at Benny.gay. Um, and then on blue sky at Benny.gay um, on blue sky, it's Benny.gay. And it's not the dot is not spelled out, but on Twitter and Twitch, the dot is spelled out. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today, Benny. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it was great to be here. <laughs> uh, right. So that was the show. Wasn't it good? Everybody, everybody really enjoyed it. Everyone listening, everyone watching. It was interesting. You were right. The conversation was interesting. I shouldn't, I sh should never have said anything. I mean, I didn't doubt it, but I just, you know what? I, I should lean into the self brag more. We got we got a boost our uh, wait. I thought you were saying that purposefully so that I could lead into the yes. And now now I'm, now I'm um why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, if you would like to pay us, <laughs> give us money. Uh, more of this stuff. Whoa. Oh, you could you could support Red Planet by being really cool and going to patreon.com forward slash red underscore planet. Um, and there are various ways to do this. And uh, as soon as I bring up the... I can hear you typing. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't just type in uh, patreon.com forward slash red underscore palnet. Um, <laughs> uh, I will tell you what That's the, the first... universe version. <laughs> Give them it's... money to to hurt us. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you can support us. You can support us from as little as uh, uh, two pound a month. Oh my goodness! Get started with your re- support for Red Planet by becoming a Sprite. It's two pound a month, and benefits include the sacred and forbidden knowledge that you're helping the Red Planet team, such as our producer Conrad, who is absolutely incredible, and our editor um that has given so much space to conrad to to be able to produce the show better oh my god could you imagine incredible um but also you get early access to vods and access to the red planet discord which is a really cool place to be and i can tell you that for a fact because that's i i'm in there all of this for just two pounds a month and or two dollars a month what a deal all of that what a deal what a deal and you can get even more with the next tier which is kara oh my goodness, you're right. It's goblin mode for $10 a month or £8.50. She's right. Everyone loves a goblin. They all get a little goblin mode from time to time. Complete your gobology by going goblin mode with everything from sprite mode and a cool pack of cool Red Planet stickers for you to stick in legal places and only in places like that and access to exclusive Red Planet Discord hang out so the first sprite mode gets you into the discord goblin mode gets you into the discord hangouts but you know what well, if i want to what if i'm feeling a little like like i want to eat food out of like a cat bowl on the ground i'm feeling that kind of energy <laughs> Uh, then you can run for uh, public office in Rochdale. Anyway, uh, so yeah, this is beast mode. Oh, wow. That was a really uh, uh, unique uh, joke that I made there. I'm not sure anyone's going to get it. Anyway, uh, it's beast mode, £17 a month or $20 a month. Holy shit. Are you going to go actually beast mode? Then, well, we can offer you all the stuff from the lower tiers and pin badges. Yeah, pin badges. I don't know why anyone hasn't changed this on the Patreon page, but it still is surprised that, yeah, we're doing pin badges. Wear your excellent new Red Planet pin badge everywhere, literally everywhere. It's completely cool and good to do so. And listen, Kira, the the the, the privilege falls on you this week to tell everybody about the final, the penultimate tier uh, that really is truly for just some of the most uh, deviant Red Planet supporters there. Uh, they're absolutely uh, uh, just full of Red Planet trivia. Like whenever anyone brings up Red Planet, which is never uh, because we're a really small show and not many people know about us, they're just bringing up all the stuff that they know about us, all the hosts, everything. Uh, what 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 can we do for them? What can we do for them, Kara? You mean like the real real perverts about it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, okay. We have a mode for them, actually. It's called Sicko Mode. Whoa! For $100 a month or 85 pounds. She's spot on. She's spot on. If you support us this much, we can only really reasonably offer you all the stuff from the lower tiers, plus a very special thank you message at the end of every stream. So, JVP, Queen Pib, Cassie Tastrophe and Risk Inverse. Thank you to our absolutely perverted sickos. Thank you so much. I we deeply appreciate your support. We do actually, yeah, genuinely. Thank you so much for supporting our show. It means the absolute world to us. Uh, but Kara, listen, uh, what, what, where, how, why? More Kara chats. Give it to me. How do I get that? Well, I am uh, going on an extended sabbatical or maybe even permanent leave. I'm not really sure what's going on. But if you still want to follow me around and, and, and spot me in the event that I do show up again, um, you can check out my link tree, linktra.ee slash Kira Chats. Uh, join my Discord. It's, it's a very active Discord. It's discord.gg slash Kira Chats. And um, yeah, all my social media is on my link tree, so you can go check that out. Don't check me out on Twitch, because I'm banned there. Whoa, that sounds really shit. Uh, and Twitch, f- fuck him. Yeah. That's what I got to say about that. Well, where can I find you, Mule? Well, you can find me on Twitch. Uh, Twitch.tv forward slash DJMUEL. Solidarity, uh, what? 
what Solidarity, is uh, yeah, you know, uh, no, uh, but no, I, I'm on linktree.ee forward slash uh, forward slash DJ M U E L. I stream on both Twitch and YouTube simultaneously, so you can find me on either of those. But also, I make video essays. I make videos on YouTube. Uh, please go check out my most recent video. It's about AI and how AI kind of. Uh, could just be like destroyed by communism or turned into something else uh, more useful and good and fine. Um, but yeah, no, uh, uh, that's that's that really. I got a Patreon. You could go on my Patreon and you can check out like uh, the 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 new video that's coming up very soon. And I'm not going to say too much about it. And that's not just because I haven't written it yet. Um, it's it's also because uh, you can find that out on the Patreon. It's paywalled. Is it about me? Yes, it's all I'm about Kira. Finally, gonna do a, a Kira <laughs> tribute for her, her, her wonderful jokes and her kindness. I'm gonna wow. do a yeah. I'm gonna do a video that's gonna. She's it's so gonna, funny and nice. Yeah, it's gonna make all the people who said that I'm a white knight for you and <laughs> all I'm interested in is having sex with you. They're gonna be like, yes, we were right. Um, so yeah, that's it's not, it's, this. This isn't happening, by the way. Just in case anyone. <laughs> Any, anyone's uncertain isn't and not happening. able yet y- yet exactly yeah this is the <laughs> you know it will never happen if you don't give mule money that's for sure if you give him money it will ne- it will be a possibility mm-hmm. so what's your patreon uh- <laughs> it's patreon.com forward slash dj m-u-e-l please All give right. me money i need it to live uh the next the person that we should mention because he is not here it's our sweet timothy timmy two times we love big tim uh please head over to linktra.ee forward slash dread conquest for all of tim's links he's a wonderful wonderful comrade and we miss him very much where is he why is he not here today what the fuck uh he's actually doing something really cool uh but i'm sure i'll tell you about it next week and that's where we'll see you thank you very much we're gonna do this we're gonna do the thing oh other way see you later bye everyone Uh, bye